model kind of common uh, distributed com computing situations. And I can go into a little bit of detail about that, but sort of broadly, the, the kind of idea is that state is actually quite important, not in its detail, but like the general idea of kind of people converging on the same state. And instead of like decorating particular vertices with lots and lots of self edges to kind of model that sort of state, it, it really sort of will behoove us, make us help us stay sane if we can resort to, you know, things like colors or numbers, whatever, to, to encapsulate that. Um, but then I can give some simple examples where I think the rubber meets the road for, you know, spawning multiple processes or, or um, multiple um, uh, nodes that are kind of like managed by a single master node and then communicate amongst themselves. And that'll give us the ability to model things like Paxos and Raft and all these sort of distributed consensus algorithms, as well as things like, you know, the blockchain, which I think will be very interesting to look at. I think it sounds great. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm all in favor, you know, what we're doing with the minimal Wolfen model, you know, hypergraph thing is, you know, this is, it's like we have expressions, but all we have is the structure of the expression, not any of its content. And yeah. I, you know, I did look a and little in bit. That, in that way, yeah. it's quite, it's quite analogous to combinators because they, you know, exactly. in, that, in that situation, like that's all there is. The data is the, um, the computation. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, I, I did start, I'm trying to pull it up here. I did have a little bit of a discussion. And I mean, the question is, what is the minimal way to um, kind of add, uh, did I have it here? Yeah. I mean, the sort of the minimal way. So one feature, to some extent, our rewriting rules are like general expression rewriting rules. But they're, in a sense, one level expression rewriting rules. And that's a little weird. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, so I mean, well, let's try and write down what, um, I mean, you know. This is, this is really interesting. So I haven't seen this. This is, you can basically so, model a conjunction of expressions as being the hyper edges, but where yeah, there's only one yeah. head. Yeah, that's right. Because as soon as you have multiple depths of head, you've got, um, I mean, that's not what we are naturally dealing with, although, you know, one could perfectly well generalize the model that way. Right. So, I mean, I basically, this is just saying there's a, you know, in this case, I'm saying a ternary operator f that holds the uh, essentially the pattern variables here, and um, this is then the kind of transformation one's doing. But I agree that the thing that needs to happen is, um, uh, I mean, there's there's just yeah. Gosh, I don't know why this. Is so there's it's, it seems like there's two obvious generalizations if you look at it through that lens. So one is to allow kind of f. And maybe you say this, I, I can't instantly read what you've written, but yeah. to allow different heads, and that would correspond to decorating, you know, edges of different types. That's um, correct. Yeah. And another would be to allow the Z underscore to not just be a, any Z, but like Zs of a particular form. You could imagine exactly. that where the vertices can be themselves arbitrary expressions, and then you can pattern match on them. So you could say one or two, that would be colors. Or there could even be like a register that has an integer in it that you can increment. And for that, you could use the ordinary rule delayed form of, of rewriting. Yes. To exactly. perform arbitrary computations on the right hand side when a match is made. Yep. No, I agree. Completely. I need to point out that Wolfram model does support explicitly named vertices, which means if you want to make a label for something, you could just have an edge which goes from that label to that explicitly named vertex. But we want something a little different. So we want like vertices of a particular type. So for example, imagine an integer register inside a processor. Um, you know, you might want to allow, you know, to increment that, but anywhere that that kind of vertex occurs, not a particular named vertex and that's global on the whole graph. No, I'm saying right. you make an edge from that vertex to a, another vertex, which is just integer type. Oh, as a way to decorate. I see. Type. I see. I mean, that, that's a way to have the type name be just a, you know, part of the data structure of the hyper edges. Right. Is that right? True. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, but, but let's, um, I mean, okay. So, so, you know, what's really embarrassing is I've thought about this general question of how do you do sort of symbolic transformations in this graph way, I mean, I, I last thought about it really seriously in the mid 1980s, okay? And um, 
uh, and didn't really get very Was involved. this SM, SMP? Was that no, whole... it was after SMP, actually. This was when I was working on the connection machine computer, and I was trying to use basically the ideas of symbolic transformations from SMP, but was trying to do that for a distributed, because, you know, in SMP, as in Wolfram language, you know, there is the standard notion of recursive evaluation. The question is, if that evaluation was going to happen on many processes asynchronously, how do you think about it? And yeah. that got me into thinking, well, uh, you know, why not just do graph transformations and have them sort of knit together? But I didn't really make good progress on that. And I think what we're talking about now is exactly that kind of style of programming where we're saying, you know, I mean, the Okay, so so the big difference between you know what we are used to with expressions is, you know, expressions are trees. You traverse them in a certain way. They evaluate. They they transform, etc. But it's like each expression has control over its own treeing out. Whereas here, what's going on is that different things, different you know, uh, sort of. We're, we're, what am I trying to say? I mean, this this combination of hyperedges, it's not saying that, that these hyperedges are chosen because of what they contain. They're not chosen because those hyperedges were already together in an expression, so to speak. If that makes any sense. I mean, are you sure about that? Well, I'm not. I mean, okay. Look, the difference here is okay. Let let's look at standard evaluation model. Okay, you know, mm -hmm. evaluation model. The standard evaluation. I mean, not. The standard evaluation model is you're going down essentially is essentially a tree based model right whereas here the standard evaluation model is some kind of graph based model i mean in the standard evaluation model you are doing sort of uh, you know recursive descent depth first whatever in essentially a tree like expression or you're doing that i mean i'm i'm um, Whereas here, uh, so there's some cases where it's equivalent. Like I think, for example, if you can form a rooted tree that represents the graph, then you can build an expression that has the equivalent kind of topology to that to that graph. But not all I, graphs will be like that. Right? I agree. Yeah, I agree. So it might be instructive for us to do that to look at the case where um, you know I should read what I actually wrote here. Which was only a short while ago, but but um, um, you know, abstract rewriting that operate on hypergraphs or general collections of relations. Frameworks like lambda calculus or combinatorial logic have some similarities, but focus on defining reductions for tree structures rather than general graphs or hypergraphs. Yeah. Well, the kind of um, the sort of like fun idea that that naturally pops into my head is whether there's some, something similar to what happens in differential geometry, where you can take something that is a graph, but by setting up a coordinate system, you can represent it as trees, but no single tree can kind of like represent the whole graph, uh, but the union of them can. And as long as there's some like concrete way of translating between those views. Well, you're talking about coordinate patches of some kind. Right, exactly. But sort of tree, like each one is a tree. That's what well, a except coordinate that, patch that, is. Why did you say it's a tree? It's an array. I mean, in, but in this in this case, no, no, I understand. So I understand. So you're saying, but I'm not sure that's the right way to think about it. I mean, you know, a local tree. I mean, I think by saying local tree, you are effectively talking about some uh, way to break down. You know, ultimately there are total orders going on. Ultimately, you're going to evaluate some things at least locally in a definite order. Right, yeah, but so so some graphs won't have a total order, right? Representing that there's no like cyclic graphs, you can't, in the obvious way, you can't kind of like represent right. them. Right, those a tree. are the closed. But as long as you, yeah, yeah, right. But as long as you stop early, you can represent parts of it as a tree, and then you can define rewrites that maybe occur on those those trees rather than on the whole graph. I'm I'm just pointing out, I suppose, that there's like there might be a class of graph rewrite systems that can be suitably modeled in these tree based kind of charts. Right. Well, I think that that's, you know, that not that 
in the geometry case, I mean, you know, there's closed time like curves, which are loops, which in which, but there's this general notion of strong hyperbolicity, this ability to essentially make a front of the, uh, of the sort of progression of time that is, that doesn't get, um, you know, where there's always a front that moves forward, so to speak. Um, and, and, I and, and there are theorems that say effectively, if you have a complete hyperbolic surface of any kind, then its hyperbolic structure lifts to its to its own universal cover, which is equivalent in the graph case to saying exactly what Tully is saying that that you know you have some arbitrary uh, some some DAG, and as long as it doesn't contain CTCs, or as long as you can isolate the CTCs, you can represent it locally by coordinate patches that are all tree-like. Hmm. Why are you saying tree-like? Because I don't understand the relationship. I mean, normally coordinates. Um, well, let me understand. Okay, so so the basic point here is the you know hyperbolicity is the statement that there there exists a way uh, to to make sort of uh, uh, sort of um, a front of time, so to speak, that progresses. You know, no no CTCs, etc. And is this with respect to like a Minkowski metric or something? Uh, a CTC is a topological property. It doesn't depend on the metric. Okay. No, but but I mean, so so this to give an example here. I mean, well, we can let's make an, we could make some examples of things which are strongly hyperbolic and which are not. Um, got your favorite example? Uh, the um, Okay, uh, someone is pointing to a, a GitHub uh, issue in, um, uh, okay, we'll look at this in a moment. Um, um, but surely the, what, like, you know, you talk about like light cones or whatever, that is with respect to some metric. No, like, it's a purely graph theoretic property. I mean, this this is what we're talking about. I'm I'm trying to find an example. I've got a, a, a I've got a bunch of black holes here on my screen, which are not so <laughs> useful. I mean, I the the you know these things are mostly so we we've got this now this the system for working out. Um, let's see what happens to our beautiful system for doing um, causal connection testing. Um, so we have this notion. What happens to this in the case where hyperbolicity fails? Jonathan, do you have a comment on that? Um, well, nothing other than that causal connection doesn't, the, the, the events that get causally connected don't increase monotonically with time. Or time doesn't increase monotonically with causal connection, so to speak. So what will this do? As we, uh, so what this is doing is it's looking at light cones from different events and seeing what, uh, what overlap there is in those light cones for the sake of you know, discovering black holes and things. Okay, and so, so for example, some of these, I might have an example here. Um, some of these, these are, this is sort of the signature of a black hole. This is a piece of the, this is a, a collection of causally equivalent events that can lead to another collection of causally equivalent events, but only one way. Is that defined as, there's a kind of, I suppose, a, a partial ordering of like causal cone containment. That's I'm correct. I'm just kind of riff, yeah, riffing correct. that. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. That's that's what this is doing. This is looking. That arrow represents. So so what this is doing is every dot are events at some point here, which are causally equivalent, in the sense that the ultimate future light cones of those events are the same. Okay. So for example, one event might fill the whole universe eventually. Its light cone, its future light cone, might, might eventually fill the universe, and another event might similarly fill the universe eventually. Those two events are considered causally equivalent and, and are compressed into this one point. Hmm. Okay. Can, can I? Um, sorry, go on. Sorry, Kirk, I wanted to ask the, like, what the lattice structure on this looks like. Jonathan, were you going, to, see, you were going yeah. to say something? something? I, well, I was going to explain why we don't need a lattice structure, why the, why the whole thing is, is independent of coordinates and, and the metric. Um, which is for the same reason that it is in standard relativity. So in, in ordinary relativity, um, the the causal structure is defined entirely in terms of differential topology. So you so the 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 causal structure of your manifold uh, is 
one way you can define it is it's all of the stuff that is invariant under conformal rescaling. So if you have your metric tensor, you multiply it by some conformal scaling factor, the, you know, the independent of that factor, that, that, uh, the causal structure is always the same. And the causal structure is the thing that tells you that this, this partial order that gives you, or this actually a collection of partial orders that tell you chronological precedence, causal precedence, strict chronological and causal precedence, and horismus, which is the kind of the, which is the boundary of the, the light cone. Um, horismus, and, I love that. What does that word mean? <laughs> I, 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 I mean, you just like, told me what like it means, but in, yeah. yeah. Okay, horismus. So am I right in guessing that the, and again, I'm operating outside of my domain here, but am I right in guessing that the, the thing that's preserved under all of these conformal rescalings is the signature? Is it precisely the signature? No, it's more than that. It's much it's, more it's, than that. It, well, it's the, I mean, it, it, the signature is preserved in the sense that you can recover the signature from the causal network. But the, the, the point is the thing that's, con, that's uh, conserved is the causal network. Um, sure, okay, fine. And that's okay. exactly what is conserved by those conformal rescalings. That's the, that is almost by definition, the, um, you know, causality and conformal, you know, causality is what is preserved by conformal rescaling. And I see. Exactly. And it is the, it is the complete, but, but I want to come back to, okay. So, so uh, we need to talk about hyperbolicity and we need to show some examples of hyperbolicity, but I want to come back to, and I'm, I'm kind of rusty on this topic because it's been, well, it's been like nearly 40 years. Um, but uh, this, this whole question about, um, you know, what the right generalization is for decorating with data I mean, because in a sense, the achievement of the, the current Wolf model idea is precisely this, this notion that um, this is a completely undata decorated thing. You know, it's, it's a thing that is just purely, you know, the full version of one of these might be something like, you know, whatever it is, X. Well, and then we have this weird thing that, that on the right hand side, we're essentially creating a, um, uh, you know, a new variable here. And whatever it is, you know, whatever the whatever the thing is. But this is this is the typical form of, um, uh, you know, whatever whatever we type in here. But but you know, that's that's the typical thing we're doing, right? For the, for the standard model. Now, you say I want to actually associate data. I mean, right now we are the only way to associate data that we have is by essentially decorating the graph. So, for instance, in these examples here. Um, uh, no, actually, I have an example here. Um, you know, this is a decorator that Max made. Well, um, the, the simple, you can just add the edge, which will say, for, for example, Z1. Well, you're saying, you're saying we, can, we can decorate this. So what you did here was you, you decorated by having a self-loop. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's a total hack because you're decorating by like having one self-loop or two self-loops, right? You're encoding the, 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 the tape states on a Turing machine. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, because it's, it's universal. That's fine. I mean, that's great. But no, no, I understand. But what you're saying is make it more convenient to program. And I agree with you. Yeah, so I'm, I'm it's, trying like, to it's like we wouldn't, we wouldn't try to do number theory with combinators, even though in theory we could. <laughs> right, so I, 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 I think this is a fantastic topic, Tally, and a topic which you and I spent almost a decade working together on uh, you know, language design kinds of things. And this is a great topic for, but let's, so let's think about this. I'm, I'm just, you know, the base case is you, there's nothing there, so to speak. Um, and now the question is, how do, we, how do we first put something there, right? As opposed to just encoding everything. And what Max is saying is instead of X blank, Y blank, I mean, so, so we could trivially, do things where we, for example, decorate this. Where instead of saying, you know, we could say this is, um, you know, an F of X blank here, and that's a G of Z blank there, right? Um, but what we've still got, or alternatively, we could decorate by saying this thing here is an F. So that means we're we're labeling. This is a certain type of edge. This is an F type of edge. This is a G type of edge. And right, we're saying. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that's, that's how we're going to label those things. And um, uh, so, but what we're doing that's a little bit unusual in computing is we're still saying there's a soup. And every time an F, an F edge meets a G edge, something happens, which is just feels, I mean, it's similar to saying, you know, if I were to say F of, 
you know, f of g of x blank, comma, list x blank, y blank, uh, colon equals whatever, um, you know, that would be another thing where if you happen to see a piece of tree that looks like this, transform it like that. Right, right yeah. But I, I suppose the, the place where we can go far beyond the ordinary kind of mathematical model of evaluation of tree rewriting is that um, that soup doesn't have to have any of those pieces in common. So you could have f of x, g of y, and we introduce a new edge. And that's like highly non-local, right? That's like you're reaching across the universe to build a new expression out of two disembodied expressions that had nothing in common. In other words, those two expressions in my analogy with differential geometry, those two expressions were in completely different charts. Like there was no way to represent them rooted in a single tree and yet they can participate in pattern matching. So I see that as, that's the kind of direction of generalization from Mathematica's evaluation semantics is yes. to allow this kind of disembodied action at a distance with respect to rewriting. But, but so, so let's take that in the distributed computing direction. What that's basically saying is there are two processes, and I mean, because I don't quite understand this operation. I mean, in, in the world of, of um, you know, data flowing and all that kind of thing. This is like saying two processors, this one has, you know, this one is ready, this one is ready, they're going to combine together to make something else. Sure. Well, so I've thought a little bit about how 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 you would represent something like a little cluster that spins up like a, I don't know, mm -hmm. Paxos cluster or something. And I think the fundamental point is just like from an engineering predictability point of view, there's always one master that is spawned and then sort of like creates its little legion of followers that will do its bidding, right? And they can renegotiate who's the master, but fundamentally it's kind of rooted in one thing. And any sort of causal relationships can be traced back to the authority of that master, right? I'm not saying that's the only way to design distributed computing stuff, but that seems to be the sort of one of the well, so, so what that represents, paradigmatic. Yeah. Right, that is a tree subset of a causal graph to say that that's what's happening, right? If you have a master that is distributing uh, causal relationships to its servant, so to speak, then I think that corresponds to a tree in the causal graph. I, I agree. And I think from a, from a state point of view, if we imagine the hypergraph picture for this, we're starting with a single vertex. And in that initial, let me get spun up state that it's in, it's like I'm booting up state, right? Its very first rule is to spawn a bunch of new vertices that have causal connections back to it in the sense that they have ordinary hyper edges back to it. And that's then, those hyper edges then define the channels of communication that are available for this particular distributed consensus algorithm. Okay, well, let's look at that more precisely. It's a neighbor, it's a neighbor independent substitution system. Yeah, that's what I think, which means that what you can do, so this is essentially a tree based you're saying this is sort of tree-based causal graph. Okay, so let's look at that. So let's let's look, for example, at um, well. So what do we want to do? We want to we want to look at um, uh, um, the source function of um, the uh, uh, substitution system causal graph. Just a, a practical consideration. Does uh, Wolfram model and all of those functions, do they support uh, tagged edges or annotated edges? Max? No, not edges. Okay. I mean, the only thing you can have is explicitly named vertices. Okay. So you can well, use this a... to annotate vertices, but not edges. That'll be enough to get us started, I think, actually. Okay, so this is naively. This is this is a typical, your average, tree-based causal graph, right? Sure. And um, so is that, that is. Is what that the state? Is that the state graph or the? Graph? No, that's the that's the causal graph of events. So this is if I were to look at this. So let me let me be clear about what this actually is. This is not a multi-way graph. This is the pure. So, I mean, the, if I were to look at the pure evolution here, this is um, this is just the very boring um, that's just that. And so okay. what's happening here is this is um, um, the ancestry tree for any given A, isn't it? That is correct, yes. 
it's well it's yeah right but each event here is a rewriting of an a by two a's okay and this is showing how do you get to you know in the end this thing here because what we're doing is okay this substitution this causal graph could be foliated in different ways what we are choosing to do here is to foliate it in a way where we're saying do as many substitutions as possible at this level right we could equally well have a foliation where we're slicing this way where we're only doing some parts of that you know sequence of a's so to speak right where we didn't reach we didn't do all of those events time is not going you know we're not we're not sort of going horizontally down this this picture so vertex so sorry basic question vertices here are actually rewrites they're not states that's correct this one is a, is a causal graph where every vertex is a rewrite so mm -hmm. can we show uh, okay now remember this is not a multi-way graph this is this is just showing for a particular uh, for a particular sequence of rewrites this is showing the causal relationships between those rewrites i mean if we were to take uh, the multi-way analog of this And is this this is the kind of graph where there are, there are some versions like in the in the, the the blog post in the paper where the edges are annotated with the image of the actual state at that at that point. Is um, that correct? Or is that a different yeah, kind? Yeah, bah, 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 bah. Um, um, do we have versions of that? Yeah, we we could do that here. Yes, we could do that here. We could say I don't know whether this particular thing provides that, but we could yes, we could show for every one of those dots. We could show where in the sequence that substitution was actually made, right? So, so this one here is the A goes to AA, which was just made in the whole thing. This one here will be that second A getting rewritten, and so on. But now, so here we could look at. Um, let's try doing this, and we could say um, evolution events graph. Is that right? Okay, so this slightly harder to, so this one is a multi-way graph, which in this particular case isn't, well, this is showing, I guess it's not that exciting in this case. I think it's, I think it's basically equivalent. This is showing the initial condition state. This is showing its rewrite. That's showing its event going to another state. This state has two events, non-overlapping, that are rewriting the first day, rewriting the second day. This one has three events and so on. Does that make sense? So that other picture was, so notice that this is just going up linearly, right? The number of A's here is going up linearly. What the other graph was doing was it was saying, let's take this and let's um, do as many events as can be done in parallel. Am I getting myself confused or am I, am I is that, that um, I think that's right, Jonathan. Can you unconfuse if you think that's confused? I think that's that's the correct. No, I, thing, I so. think that's the that's the right. Yeah. But but now, how do we actually see in this picture? How do we see what can be done in parallel? Well, answer. What we need to do here is look at the um uh um. We need to kind of look at the causal relationships here. So I think what we want is um. What is it called? Evolution causal graph? That's what it's called. I, I, I don't know what you're looking at. I mean, yeah, if you want to add the causal ledgers, then yes, it's evolution causal graph. OK. Oh, that's hard to understand. But that's going to show us, well, this is a multi-way thing. I mean, uh, I'm trying to show which things can happen simultaneously. Because here, what we're showing is a bunch of these pieces right they're one two but here we're only showing three but in fact but here that level shows four right so what what's going on there can i can i ask some questions about this so the simultaneity thing can we state that precisely so two events are simultaneous are can be made simultaneous if and only if what the inputs mm -hmm. don't overlap Just if, if so, but I, I was saying that if there's space like a branch light that can be simultaneous, is a time like they cannot? And time like means, you know, this is okay, so, from one to another in the causal graph. Right, in the causal graph. So this is not showing 
if it's only when I add these causal edges that I can see which ones are causally connected. Now, what this is showing is all causal edges. It's not showing, okay. Do we have a way to, to show the actual events here? I, I need to look that up. Isn't um, there no simultaneity in this system because it's only growing by one letter at each, at each uh, step, I guess, each, each update? Well, th this is the distinction between multi-way system and generational multi-way system. Generational multi-way system would show the analog of the, of the substitution system, causal graph case. Oh, so should I, should I okay, should, should I run generational multi-way system here? Uh, you can do. Well, t t tell us what, what will make it clear us what's going on. So this. Oh, yeah. So th uh, then you should run states graph. Can I get the causal graph there? No. Okay, but, but let, let's explain to people what, how we get the generational multiway system from this multiway system here. What we're saying is, well, like we are, I say, you're, you're, you're taking the sets of events that don't have overlapping inputs. Right. But how do we indicate what those are here? I, I'm, I'm, let me look at um, something else. Um, let me look at the uh, substitution system causal graph. And um, I think I had several different functions here that... Um, Okay, this is yet another one of these. Okay, so let's look at this. This is the state analog. That's absolutely not what I wanted, but but that's okay. So here we go with this. It's showing something different, but let's let's try this. Oh. I need to do that. Okay, so those are the one, one to one, two. That's like a little coordinate. There's a little exactly. patch of, okay, I see. And that's what they really are, I see. And then what happens here, if I do substitution system causal plot on this, that's going to pick up all those places and it's going to show me, hopefully. Um, yeah, okay, so this one wasn't that exciting. But what that's showing is those are the states there. Right. This is this is the state. It goes a a a a a a, and this is with a particular evaluation order, which is saying, do those updates to those two pieces of that state at the same step here. Does that make sense? So an alternative would be that I could say something like, um, uh, okay, hold on. What did I do there? I thought I had a way to do random updates here. Um, Humph. Hold on one second. I thought that was an example that it had in the other. Oh, I think we failed to. Oh. Wait a minute. Causal evolution. Oh, that's right. That's right. So causal evolution. This is a very shoddy thing. Wow. Look at this. This does not have documentation. Unless I'm completely confused here. How did that happen? Humph. C can somebody make a note of that so we go fix that? Nope. Okay. Let me um, just deal with that then. Um. Are we trying to get at? Are we trying to get at um, some notion of causal independence? Do we want a graph of which vertices are causally independent from which others? I mean, that that is that we. I, I wrote code that does that. That was the the code I wrote for the black hole discussion. I see. And so, what that just to under, so I can understand, mm -hmm. what that does is it looks at a what is it? What what is the input to that algorithm? Uh, well, it, it, it's just the specification of some substitution system or Wolfram model system. Okay, but conceptually, the way to run that is to run it on the multi-way evolution. Or... Uh, well, I mean, yeah, there, there's there are two cases, right? There's the space-time case and the multi-way evolution case, and um, but they're both combinatorially they're both just doing the same thing. They're looking for um, you know f 
future light cones in the multi-way system, uh, sorry, in the, in the causal graph that don't uh, intersect. I see. Um, up to any time, just like t infinity. Yeah, or, or so, some finite approximation to infinity. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. In practice. So one, I mean, one one thing I wanted to introduce is the idea that there should be like a relative version of causal dependence. In other words, if I'm looking from over here, um, I've given you know, we might have we might have rules that are not. It's not obvious that they're causally invariant. They take like twenty steps to to resolve. But if I wait long enough, then I will discover that two things that appear to be causally dependent have become causally independent by virtue of the fact that after enough time, they sort of cancel out, so to speak. That's, is that, that's, does that does that make sense, or is that nonsense? That's an interesting idea. That yeah that. That essentially in the multi-way, if you take the multi-way causal graph and you take its transitive reduction, that when you have branch pair convergence, you can get dis uh, you know, disappearing causal edges, so to speak. Um, hmm. Because the causal edges on one branch kind of over you know, eat up the causal edges on a different branch. That's an interesting point. Hadn't really thought of that before. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I missed this. Could, could you re replay for a second? Well, just for like a very high level, it's like things relative to other things. So causal independence, but relative to a particular time or foliation, you know, leaf or um, a particular state, um, because those could be different from the general T goes to infinity notion of causal independence. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, things, things appear to be independent um, um, in the universe, but... Um, um, right, but eventually, you know, a signal passes between them and they're no longer independent. No, no, no. We're talking about the opposite problem, I think. Mm, yeah. I think we're talking so about too. the case. Yeah. So I think what, what Tali was raising is this interesting point that you could have, you know, you could have two multi way branches where uh, th if things along both multi way branches appear, you know, the system appears to be causal invariant because it has a long branch pair resolution time. And things on the two multi way evolution branches are causally connected. But then eventually they converge. And so then if you take the transitive reduction of the multi-way causal graph, the co half of the causal edges will appear to disappear. Well, if you see what I mean, they, they will, because half of them are now <laughs> That was a uniquely confusing sentence. Yeah. Yeah. To disappear. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, so a concrete version of that would be two events that seem to affect each other, right? So they're causally dependent. They affect, mm -hmm. how, how exactly does that work? They are time like they have a time like connection. That they is have a time like they have an event in the causal graph is connected to, to has a, an edge that connects it to another event in the causal graph. That means that they are causally dependent. Right. Otherwise known as having a time like edge connecting them. Okay, right. And then the claim would be that yes, so seen immediately, the one is is causally connected to the other. But if you wait long enough, that causal connection evaporates because of kind of things settling down due to eventual consistency, so to speak. I'm just trying to decide. I'm not, if I'm not quite world. seeing that. I'm not quite seeing that. I don't understand. Yeah. Get rid of in the multi-way. Right, let, let's just just, well, just that's, that's, <laughs> obviously you wouldn't in the pure multi-way causal graph. That, you know, the, the, that was why I was mentioning the transitive reduction thing, right? Because if you have two multi-way evolution branches and they eventually converge at the same state but the two branches are kind of homogeneous with respect to their causal edges, then when you take the transitive reduction, half of them will disappear. I'm now confused what on earth I meant. So Donovan, if you, can you, can you lead us back or we could also move on to something else. I can probably construct an explicit version. Give me a minute. Okay, hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to show this, which I think is instructive. Okay, so let me explain the relationship between these two pictures, okay? So this is an A goes to AA substitution system, okay? Here, it's randomly picking which A goes to AA to do. Does that make sense? Mm. It's picking it's doing up to, multiple ones at each step. It's doing up to five at each step. So okay. I can change that, and I can say only do up to two here. Or okay? one. Yeah, for example, one. Right, that would be a, and so one, 
it's just going to keep uh, okay so now what causal invariance means is that eventually if we wait you know the causal dependence here if we if we add the causal edges here which go between the you know which show which event is causally dependent on which other event and i think we can just say causal graph arrow true here okay so that shows that shows the causal graph drawn on top of that that sequence of events that makes sense and mm. what's being said is because this is a causal invariant system you know you could arbitrarily pull this out but the causal graph that shows the dependence is, is always going to be the same so if i were to make this not a random thing here but i were to just make it the um uh the fully filled in version oops i don't want that um okay there's the fully filled in version that's all the causal dependences of one event on another right so every event here you know the two events down there are causally dependent on that one event there because the A's that came that were contributed into those events came from that event there. Does that make sense? Yes. See, this would this would be a lot easier to track if if the A's were labeled and had some some state to them besides being A. Sure, sure, and I think that's what we want. Right, right. Um, I mean, that's what we're that's what we're trying to come back to is, okay. In a sense, okay. So maybe we, what we want to do is think about string sub. Let, let's let's think about the case of string substitution systems before we get to hypergraphs, because mm -hmm. we've already got, um, you know, many of the same issues. But but what we want to do, in a sense, we can set up this whole structure. Not yeah. Why don't we just think about? Um, just trying to think. I mean, see, the issue is with strings, you just are dealing with concatenation. You're so well, okay. Well, we, well, the natural generalization for string rewrites is to allow like a little regex in there. So it can say things like, I'm not suggesting that you match arbitrarily complicated substrings, but I am suggesting that you allow like blanks or patterns in the string and I agree. you can transform them on the right hand side with an arbitrary function. Yes. Like one I agree. goes to. I yeah. agree. Even even if you don't do the transformation, you've already got another class of systems that have essentially pattern variables instead of just literals in the in the in the system, in the string here. But but actually, I think there's a different thing we could try. Okay, so let's talk about standard uh, transformation rules on expressions because we can imagine drawing causal graphs and all this other stuff for standard transformation rules on expressions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. ordinary Mathematica. Yeah, but that's the combinator thing that you were investigating before. Um, well, a bit. I mean, yes, it, it is related to that. But I mean, that's if we're asking the question. So I'm, I'm still trying to get a sense. What is the minimal? So I'm going to make a claim here that the minimal, um, you know, minimal distributed computing, okay, is um, basically a set of independent evaluators independent, you know, um, well, essentially it's evaluators. And then the real question is how do they interact? Because, yep. and they, they so what, uh, and, you know, how do we represent, you know, in a program, how they interact? So, so we could perfectly well have, you know, each independent set of independent evaluators, potentially each running the exact same, pro probably, probably each running the exact same rules. Sure, you can always like mix, you know, if they have different roles, they can just be in a bigger transition right. matrix so, that models that. Right. So so the minimal case of this will be a cellular automaton. I claim. That's the minimal case is, you know, a CA where essentially what's happening is the independent evaluators. So notice that a CA has a very stylized way of um of taking its sort of uh of you know, so the most minimal thing is the evaluators don't depend on anything other than what's happening inside their own universe, so to speak, inside their own yep. node. OK, so now the next case is they start pulling in stuff from other nodes, right? So the minimal mm -hmm. case is a CA. The next, next case would be a graph CA, where there's a fixed graph. Um, and 
um, okay, fixed graph, but um, uh, that defines connections between processes. Now, right, exactly, yeah. Okay, so now let's 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 look at what this all means. So we can draw a causal graph for each of these. So for a cellular automaton, what is the causal graph? The answer is, I think we've drawn these. Didn't Max? Didn't you draw one of these, the cellular automaton causal graph? I think we even had one here. Um, yeah. So I think that causal graph. Go ahead. What? This is a foliation. So notice, okay, this is kind of interesting. So this is an emulation of a cellular automaton, right? And this cellular automaton right. has noticed that it can be foliated in different ways. Tally. Mm. Yep. Right? So in other words, the thing is, you know, in order to find the value of that cell, it better be the case that its past light cone is all evaluated. Yeah. Right? You don't, in order to value, find the value of that cell, it doesn't really make any difference whether the past light cone of this cell is all evaluated. Yeah. So, so in a sense, we already have, I'm going to take that case over here. Um, we already have an example here of where, of sort of a, a, a change. So, so we've got a causal graph here. What, okay, first question is, what does the causal graph look like for a cellular automaton? I believe it is just something where every cell just depends causally on, let's say, the three cells directly above it. Is that correct? Max, can you can you comment on that? Well, pretty much, yeah. Well, is that but I mean, there, won't there be cancellations of various kinds? Like if, you know, if it just doesn't matter what the, the previous vertices are, because they're all, you know, you can have sections where the, the past light cone, like it just doesn't care about certain chunks because they don't, under the rule, they don't make a difference. That's correct. But that that's data dependent. And I guess, okay, so there's a question. All right, so there's the minimal, um, minimal causal graph, um, sort of the, the boilerplate causal graph um, for the CA. And then there's, um, okay, then there's two levels. The next level is the rule dependent causal graph. And the well, next right. level. In some cases, you can optimize it and then it may have smaller causal graphs. Right. But then the next level is data dependent causal graph, right? So that is, for example, if you're doing, I don't know, hash life or something, then you don't need to run this giant, um, uh, you know, a blank area in the game of life is just going to stay blank. You see what I'm saying? You don't need yeah. to. Um, um, I think it's still rule dependent. It is, yeah. This is a hierarchy, right? There's the boilerplate graph, which is just dependent on the background space, right? Then there's the rule dependent one, and then. Um, well, all you can really say here is that you know that. Um, the real causal graph, which is the data, data dependent one, is a subset of the rule dependent one, is a subset of the boilerplate one. Yes. Like those other two are virtual, they're not like ever really instantiated, right? That's true. I mean, in the physics case, that's absolutely true. But, but yeah, I mean, the thing I'm trying to understand is we're, we're making a minimal you know, model of distributed computing here. And what we want to do is we want to understand as we, as we go, you know, in the hypergraph case, so, so what's happened, okay. You know, in my own journey from cellular automata to you know hypergraphs, right? Cellular automata have data in them. They have a fixed background and they have data. Hypergraphs do not have a fixed background and they don't have data. Right. So what you're saying is, what's in between those two things? What has a you know what has non-fixed communication channels? I mean, the hypergraph is only communication channels, so to speak. It doesn't have data. Yeah. Right. So what we're saying is in a more realistic case. So so the thing about distributed computing is much of the time, as you're pointing out, the um, the communication channels are deeply stylized. They're just master slave, you know, tree based or whatever. It is very rare. I mean, that was, for example, in the connection machine computer, the hope was that one could have arbitrarily programmable, um, you know, uh, communication. So, for example, one thing I made this language, which never 
got properly implemented called C-Star, which was a generalization of C for distributed computing. And one of the features it had was given a, there were sort of super pointers that corresponded to processors. And so one of the operations was, you know, given a super pointer uh, ID, call it P or something, star P, you know, X equals star P would actually get the data from the processor at location P, if that makes sense. Hmm. Right. So in other words, that was a case where you could, I mean, normally, you know, normally you just have, uh, you know, pointers, in, you know, okay, in normal computing, right, you just have pointers arranged in, in, you know, in linear memory. But the idea where, well, see, it's a little complicated because that case already we have the, you know, we have random access memory. We have the fiction that you can, you know, I, I guess the point in the in that case was that if you do an operation, x equals star p, both x and p can be parallel in a storage class called parallel. Does that make sense? Okay. It sounds so then, like you might have been might have been designing something similar to promises, modern day promises. Could be. I mean, the way that worked was the way the thing worked was you say x equals. Okay, so let's say you say in in that um, you know parallel x and uh, parallel x star p or parallel int x star p, for example. And then what you would do is you would say x equals uh, star p, and what that would do is in parallel it would set you know the the x variable for each processor to i'm now i mean it's been listen it's been a very long time here nearly 40 years since i really thought about this so i don't think i've thought about this much since so but the, the basic point was this this would route data all over the machine does that make sense okay okay because because what's doing is it's saying this is this is a big parallel array of addresses this is and, and this is saying go indirect to that whole parallel array, array of addresses. Okay. So now one thing we don't have in either the hypergraph model or any of these things, we don't have addresses. We, you know, in this case, we actually in you know we only implicitly have addresses. Right. I mean, you know, just like in normal programming, right? You don't actually, in modern times, in ancient times, you would do this. You'd say, you know, I want the the data at position eight one eight one in memory, right? But you don't normally do that. Today, you normally have idealized away the actual pointer location, right? So, similarly, I mean, in in the cellular automaton, you are not idealizing that away. You're saying it's only plus minus one in this case. Uh, is the you know is the location you're going to get data from? I mean, is this making sense? I mean, so so look, I mean, we we we've got these different cases, right? We've got a lattice, an array-based CA. We've got a graph-based CA. Then the next level up is something where the structure of the graph. I mean, that's what these whole hypergraph models are doing. Is they're saying make the structure of the graph dynamic. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I mean, the place that I naturally wanted to jump to was that case, because I think right, you can but, just but, do a lot. Yeah, I agree. I think that case is very powerful. And, and the whole point about that case is, and I think the very interesting thing is, that case is hard to wrap your head around to program in. And that's what I wanted to try to understand, is how do we, you know, by using frames and things like that, how do, first of all, how do we, you know, what, what's the closest thing that we've got to programming in that kind of environment? Right. So in other words, we're saying, I mean, it's something like what's happening in some of these distributed consensus algorithms and so on, where you're pulling data from different places and it's a dynamic graph of where you're pulling data from, I think. I'm, I'm a little lost. So like from my point of view, these are a good way to model existing distributed computing. I'm not ready to jump into them being like a new programming paradigm. They might be, but I haven't thought about it. Okay, that. but so, so, but let's think about existing distributed computing. Okay, so you know what we've got. Let, let's look at okay, existing distributed computing. You know what do we have? We have, you know, we have sort of the map produced story and so on. We have kind of the tree based data, tree based data flow. 
right? Okay. We have um, array-based data flow, which is basically the cellular automaton case, right? That's like convolutional neural nets. That's like image processing. That's those kinds of things where every element can be done in parallel depending on nearby elements in the predefined array, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, what other examples do we have here? I mean, those are two examples that we understand very well. That's like, you know, that's master slave. That's, um, you know, e.g. Fork join. Fork join is often the way that that's thought about. Okay, so c can we give some concrete examples of that? So you're saying, I don't, I don't know about that. So what, what, um, no, no, no. I would put that under tree-based data flow. So there, it's like construct. And in fact, recursion is the same thing. <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, yeah. So I think that's correct. I think recursion, ordinary recursion, is exactly tree-based data flow. Mm. It just so happens that like it's serialized onto one processor typically, but but it doesn't have as to. We've seen, that, that's the whole point. Doesn't have to be. That that yeah, was of the course. whole point of of the thing with combinators and so on is. You know, recursion does not have to be. I mean, so so that point there is, recursion could be parallelized. In fact, boy, this is taking me back. In SMP, I had an attribute for functions which said whether they could be parallelized. In other words, so what's interesting about that is, if you say f of x y z, right? Can x y z be run on different processors? Right? It it could be, you know. X, Y, Z, depending on what F is, you might or might not allow, right? I mean, you know, X, Y, Z to be run on different processors, to be run asynchronously. Okay, examples, right? If, if F is a list, you know, if it's a list, you can run it asynchronously. E.g., you know, list, async is okay. If it's a compound expression, Async is most definitely not okay, right? But so yes, that that's I mean that would be so. So in general, let's look at this in a little bit more generality. This is saying um, that um, uh, um, um, the um, uh, you know this this is. Um, you know, at this point, right, you could say this F is going to allow its arguments to be evaluated in any order you want. Or this F could insist on an ordering. So I, I, I guess one question is how does that relate to causal graphs and so on? Because essentially that F, okay, in in recursion, okay, so let's let's pick up our example, sorry, the for combinators, because we that's a case where we've actually looked at what the what the to, to give us some intuition for what's going on. Let's see, combinators. Lambda I, okay. This was, I think, Jonathan's. My God. So these were multi way systems for combinators. And multi way, I mean, this is kind of complicated, right? But so, so what does this all mean? This means. Okay, how do we tell the causal graph for combinators is going to tell us, okay, okay, the, the, you know, okay, how do we read off what, okay, so, so one thing would be um, causal graphs, causal graph implications. So, what does a causal graph look like if if something has to be run se sequentially? What does its causal graph look like? I think it just looks like a um, uh, the causal graph is just a path graph, right? It's just a time-like path graph. Is that true? Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily a path graph, but it will contain a path graph. Why isn't it a path graph? Anything that isn't well, on the path can be parallelized. Because the result of the next evaluation might depend on results, not just from previous one, but also from ones before. 
Oh, I see. I see. I see. Okay. Is it, it's just a, a time well, hypothesis? It's, or it's, it's, tra it's transitive reduction as a path graph. Yes. Okay. Which is generally what we consider anyway. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, is it or, or at least after transitive reduction? Okay. So that's what it means to have to be run sequentially, right? If everything can be run in parallel, it just means so. The next case is you've got a, you know, if you have a list and everything can be run in parallel, then your graph is just something that says, you know, one goes to two, one goes to three, one goes to four, one goes to five, and that's that's your that's your causal graph basically. That's saying the. So well, your state. Not, what's that? That your state could also have been produced using a neighbor independent substitution system. Yes. I'll yeah. also know it at some point, presumably. Actually, I think it goes the other way around. It's your your in degrees. I mean, all of this vertices go into one, not the other way around. Well, it depends what we're doing here. So, I mean, but but what I'm trying to understand is for a typical program, right? I mean, we could analyze the causal dependence of a typical program. Right? What does it actually depend on? And one of the difficulties analyzing programs is that some part of the analysis is static, and you just look at the code and see what it does, and some part is completely dynamic. And that's somewhat you know, related to our data-dependent versus rule-dependent story above. One thing that I've, I've, I have been thinking about some of this stuff for a few weeks, and one, one thing that popped out to me is that um, fundamentally, like for, for functions that you want to track a causal graph of, the sort of sites of state are going to be the vertices of that causal graph. So for example, every variable is an opportunity for um, a causal edge to yes. enter into that picture, right? And then, and then of course, the rewrites correspond to just like following the CPU just doing its thing, cranking through, through instructions. Um, and they will produce, they will kind of weave a kind of web among these different sites of state. Okay, so what you're saying here is, if we look at this, so a way to put that is every variable, every shared variable represents a state and, and a causal edge, right? Every shared variable is a causal edge. Is that not correct? Is a, let me think about that. Is a causal edge. I don't think it has to be. I think it does, because if the variable will ever be used again, that and has a it has a causal edge between its its creation and its use. If oh, it sure. Yeah, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. If it doesn't have a causal edge, then you could just as well rename it, it and not it. be sure. Right. So, exactly. so just every delete it. every every setting of a of a shared variable initiates a causal edge, which terminates when the variable is used. So what does it look like if it's written once and read many times? The answer is, which terminates when the variable is used. So, every, you know, so each write of, I mean, each read-write pair is a causal edge. Each write-read pair is a causal edge. Right, yeah. And I think um, what really helped me when thinking about this is, um, for a single processor, for a single thread of execution, there's nothing interesting going on from the perspective of the multi-way evolution graph. And that's because the, the way we write programs is that a single thread behaves deterministically, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Like it's manipulating state. So it's, it's you know, reading various variables, writing others, but um, there's, gonna, there's, go there's not going to be any ambiguity in its evolution with respect to the variables that it reads. Exactly. So, so, so there's a locus of computation right. that is completely deterministic. The only non-determinism comes from when those variables that it shares with other process threads of execution, um, the order starts to matter. Exactly. So this is it's shared very deterministic because it has a certain rewrite in order, not because the system itself is cause invariant. I'm sorry. No, yes. but I, I... Go ahead. I think the point is that when you, if you take a multi-way system and you factor it into its causal graph instances, 
those are a complete representation of the causal structure of the multi-way system, except for the existence of branch-like causal edges. Okay, what's the interpretation of a branch-like edge in distributed computing? That is basically a branch-like edge race represent... Condition. I'm very yes, confident. Yes, it's a race this. condition. We've, yeah, yeah, that's, figured that's, this out correct. Last time. that's correct. Yeah, right. Right, so, so a... Um, okay, so a branch... A branch-like edge is a race condition, right? That that is a case where the what you get on a different branch of the multi-way system gives you a different. That's a dependence between different branches of the multi-way system, where. Yeah, I think that's right. Right. Okay. Because the point is that the point is that depending on which order some transformation happened, in other words who got to the variable first, you can have two different states, right? And you hope that, I mean, the whole, the whole goal of distributed uh, consensus is to make sure that it doesn't matter what that order is, that eventually everyone will arrive at the same answer, but it might take a while to get there. Yes. Okay, so what does this mean? What is this notion of branch-like edges or race conditions? What does that mean for consensus in blockchain-like systems? Because what what is, if you see consensus happening in a blockchain system or, or some other you know, voting-based consensus system for the simplest blockchain case. Mm -hmm. um, well, I would say one thing. So yeah. um, traditional blockchain like you know, uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever, um, their, sort of, their tick rate is so incredibly slow that it's just not relevant what the latency of network connections is. It's, and that's sure. partly by, des by design, right? So I think the problem that they solve is not really one of, it's the kind of threat model for block, for Bitcoin is not so much that, you know, like people might have different notions of time. It's that um, you don't trust any particular person to manage the ledger fairly. Sure, so sure. you've got to account for that rather than for, for kind of who, who gets messages when. Um, but as soon as you move to something, I mean, the, the only problem with that, of course, is that it's like, in, in, it has to be a single error of time for everybody. Yeah, it's, incre it's incredibly slow. So as soon as you move to them, these more complicated graph-based things, then suddenly the fact that different people can have different opinions about which bank balances contain what becomes deeply relevant. And then, you know, all the cleverness is in making sure that people can trust their, you know, their opinion of what the global state is. They can't know everything. They can know the things that are relevant to the transaction they're trying to do. Right. And that's exactly, I mean, that is incredibly deeply analogous to what we're dealing with here. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I think that that, um, and uh, I mean, distributed consensus, which is what, you know, this is this is the problem with it. So what does it mean? Okay, so let's take the bank balance example, okay? You want to, what is the analogous thing in physics to that? In other words, you've got a particular node in the graph and yeah, I mean, basically, it's what the heck is it? I mean, personally, I think that Jonathan's sort of read on on how to think about the QM interpretation of of multiway systems is the right one here. It's like any individual observer must see a consistent series of events, right? Where probabilities add up to one and so on, but it doesn't mean that like globally that is the case. So similarly, like someone who's you know trying to do a transaction on the blockchain, they they, the only thing that they care about is that the balance that they, you know, debiting and, and crediting, there's enough money in the in the first account, and it doesn't matter what was going on elsewhere. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, but okay. So interpret that. I mean, so that's saying their part of the state has to be, you know, the causal chain that relates to their part of the state has to have been successfully resolved. Right. Yes, exactly. And it could leave all kinds of other things completely fuzzy. Yes. And I guess the theory is that that's what, that's what um, is responsible for, you know, all kinds of quantum weirdness is that this is fundamentally an observer effect about how you, how you um, find yourself in a particular, you know, classical thought. Yes, right. right. It, it's, it's saying that your causal invariant representation of the world doesn't kind of depend on other people's causal invariant representations of the world. It is just its own self-consistent thing. 
fair enough. Well, let's apply that then in this case. Okay, so so we've got. Can we take a very naive example? Can we take, for example, just a sorting thing, for instance, where we can have different, where the causal graph, let, let's take, um, I, I'm just trying to get I, an example. Go ahead. Could I propose something? So there is a, there's a simple thing that um, we could go with sorting, at, but this, there's something that I, I think is, is as simple as I can think of and, and has a lot of the right ingredients in it. And that is kind of everyone adding numbers together. Right, so okay. a sing a single master node spawns like I don't know five uh, clients. Let's call them. Yep. And um, those clients then send messages back to the master to add one to the master's sort of global register, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then that's the end. That's it. They do that once and then they kill themselves. Mm -hmm. um, this will make a nice little diamond. And the point is that it doesn't matter what order they sent their messages to add one to the master. It's eventually the same thing because of the, the associativity of addition, right? Right. But at any at any the foliations where you know the answer is not right <laughs> because you haven't waited long enough, but by the end everyone resolves. So that has some of the features that we would expect. But I mean, like I'm actually curious what the sorting what does the sorting example look like? How would we but add? The, your, your number adding example is exactly the A goes to A rule. Okay. I think. Which has a causal graph, which has that causal graph, you claim. Yeah, but that's yes, because. So, so this doesn't terminate. That A goes to A just goes on forever, which makes it tricky to probe, right? OK, but you're I saying. Think, but you, you, you could have something that subtracted the number of Bs and added the number of As, and then have a finite number of Bs in the initial condition, and then look at the multi-way system. Yeah, All right, let's do it. good. Let's do it. OK. Yeah, the Kim simulators counts and pretty much explicitly the Spartan rules. OK, hold on. Are we going to do, do this with strings? Let's do it with strings first, OK? OK, so you're saying we have our BBBBB counter, and we have something that says, whenever you see a B, um, remove the B and what Replace it with an A would be, the, would be the simplest thing. Don't right. we want whatever the visualization was where you can have uh, have the uh, the updates happen randomly? Because we are talking about a... a yeah, eventually thing. we do want that. Eventually we want that. But but here, I don't understand what this is doing now. So this is... I mean, so I, I, I'm really struggling with these string substitution systems for the following reason, right? There is a notion of locality. Like you think about processes. The space is discrete. Like each processor is a world into itself. It can talk to any other processor anywhere as long as there's some predefined channel between them. And like strings don't have that property for me. They like, don't. No, I, I, they absolutely don't. But I mean, your your master slave addition thing. Well, I mean, okay, I, I'm still trying to understand. So you're basically saying throw out to a could, bunch of processors. Go ahead. Well, we can actually do the master slave edition thing merely with um, existing. We don't need colors, right? Because we can just, because it's so easy, you can just add the edges directly. Can we try this? Yeah, sure. So, so the master okay. would be like one, the named vertex one, and then it goes to five different sub vertices. But importantly, they connect back to the master. Those are the channels. Okay. And by the way, Acts, this you, actually you... has a relation. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, this has a relationship to. There's a Tony Hawes thing about communicating se sequential processes that was used in Go as the kind of fundamental model of parallelism in Go. This is very similar to that. Like a, a single no process can create a, another process and a channel to talk to that, that sub-process. Okay. Yeah, th this is C CSP, right? It's the basis of closure, I think. Okay. So, well, okay, yeah, so, one... so wait a minute. So tell me how to program this. Max, Two goes to one, three goes to one, four goes to one, and then be done. That's the first rule. Wait, wait, That's the in, setup in, in rule. It's a hypergraph. Yeah, two comma one close open two comma two. I mean, two comma one what? Three comma one four comma one. No, no, the thing you had below. So one goes to one's the initial mode, right? Yep. The master. Yeah, and also, you're all delayed because of okay. the pattern that also explained. Okay, okay, so then, then two comma one close. Then 
three comma one close. And, and I mean, that's enough technically, right? Okay. So that's the setup phase. And we've got to make sure that it doesn't keep doing that. So you could go two goes to nine, three goes to nine. So now we've made a new, the master's no longer going to be spawning processes anymore. So so what do we want so to do that? Two goes to nine? Two, like two, two comma nine, sorry. Three comma nine, two comma nine in the previous rule. Because there's no state, obviously. So we've got to stop it continually spawning new children. Two comma, so instead of two comma one, right? Two comma nine and three comma nine. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So now it's different. Now it won't, it's just waiting That's there. That's one is at a different level. So it's not going to apply anymore. Because that so one is, is... Is a unary edge. It's no, missing that's a not a unary bracket. edge. That's edge, which is one. Okay, guys, I'm totally oh, perfect. No, 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 no. I understand now. I understand what Max is saying. So two comma one, three comma one. That will work, right, okay. Max? Because now that self loop has been destroyed, right? Yeah, because this ones are different. It's not a self loop. It's it's an edge okay. which equals to one. Okay. Because okay. there's only Fine. one set of curly braces. Okay. Makes sense. Okay, so it's a, it's a zero one. edge kind of thing. Okay, so then we say x comma one goes to one comma one. Okay. So the X button. Okay, I'm still yeah. fairly confused here, but okay, go on. And I can explain like... what I can explain what this is. Let, let's just run it and then then you can let's run first, explain later. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, change it to rule delayed. Also, Max, is that initial one there, open bracket to close, does that need to be wrapped in another set of brackets or not? Uh, well, it doesn't have to be. Okay. okay. So now what should I do here? What's the initial condition? Started with a zero. So, so I need to say this apart from the rules. How do I do that? Association with the key part of the rules, which goes to this. Okay. Max, shouldn't this work with the ordinary syntax? Or is it that one that's the problem? Well, no, because explicit vertices are not supported in ordinary syntax. Okay, let's just run first, explain later. What do I give as the initial? Case? List of one. Like this? Yeah. And now what should I do? Like run it for four steps or something? Mm -hmm. Okay, and now what would you like me to show? So I, I, why don't I just do? Well, um, just states list first. Okay. I'll put it in a column so you can distinguish them. In a what? In I a was column. Something. Oh, well, okay. I, I just didn't do this. Okay. So this is really simple. So what happened is the mast is called one. The mm -hmm. very first thing it did was to spawn two children processes yep. that have a connection back to it. That's the important part is that it, they know about it, right? So there are no non-local rules in the paradigm that I'm suggesting. Okay. Then um, they decide to add um, one to the register that the master has on it. And the way we're simulating that is with a self edge. So because self edges just, you know, like the number of self edges can just increase. That's a way of doing a cheap counter. You see what I mean? Okay, so you're saying if so I have an extra plus... You can literally do counter with Python rules. Say that again? You can literally do a counter with Python rules. You can just say extra plus we one do? on the right. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, minute, so, so, this, so in this case... All right, okay. So you're saying here... Are you just saying that without the one... We just say x goes to x plus one, or what? Yeah, I think so. Um, well, what's well, that? That wouldn't match to anything. Yeah, it won't match anything. But then, then you're just giving. No, we don't want that. We want x comma one. So we want. This is now a child talking to the parent, and it's going to update the parent. You see, but what I don't understand about this is how do we capture the identity of the parent here? Seems to have evaporated. Why not make these three edges? I see. Have, have two comma one and then the count. Two what is two comma one doing? Is that is that is that like explain? Ch child two is connected to parent one, but if you have child parent and then if you have the child identity, parent identity, and then the count, 
as a three. Okay, so you're saying child ID, parent ID, count, and that's representing a processor, the state of a processor. Mm, no, I don't like this because the count okay. is unique to the parent. It's not doesn't involve the child. Here's architecture I suggest. So we have two edges and three edges. Two edges just go child to parent, and then three three edge goes to parent. Then there's a string count, and then the integer. And the way okay. we'll do it, we'll have a replacement rule which would say child parent goes to parent, uh, child parent comma parent. Uh, count. Wait a minute. So, so let me make a general comment. That, like we can hack things in, but that wasn't really my point. I think we should just design the right system so we don't have to hack stuff. But for now, I just wanted to illustrate. We already have what we need. So the previous result with the two, Stephen, the one in the middle of your screen. Yep. That demonstrates everything that I wanted to demonstrate, which is okay. that um, this thing created three children. They added one to it, and the final answer was three. Now, this is not the multi-way. This is the, what is it called? Um, just just the evolution, ordinary evolution. Yeah, but this, this is the one where you do everything at once, right? It's not showing you all the, oh, it's doing the canonical evaluation. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Can you do the full multi-way state? All states at least. Uh, okay, yeah. Well, let's do the graph. Like, I don't, it'll look good, you know? The okay. South edges will show us the counter, so I think it'll be interpretable. Okay, so what are you suggesting here? So you're saying we, we, we should make the causal graph of this? No, the state, uh, the, what, what, the multi way state evolution I, graph. I want to see the causal graph of this first. Sure. Okay, so that causal graph does kind of what I would expect. It has an initial event that, um, um, uh gets distributed to these three processors and then those processors i don't quite understand the communication back to the parent here i mean the, the point is that they're communicating in a way that's because it's like a billion it doesn't matter right it doesn't so they don't affect each other that's the thing about addition what yeah. you could do is you could if you made four of these guys we might see more interesting structure i think we might can we try that yeah four four what think, four processors there yeah so we'll, we'll, why would there be a different structure? Yeah, I don't see why uh, there's a different structure. Just intuition, but maybe I'm wrong. No, it's just going to be the same thing. It's going to be a big, okay, fine. you know, just going to distribute out like that. Now, I don't understand. Can we, yeah. can we look at the multi-way state evolution graph? Because I think that that's the real picture I really wanted all along. <laughs> right. How do, the, does this, does the multi-way, how do we do this in the multi-way system? Uh, you don't. Ugh. Okay, so we can't because we can't do the, these pattern-based rules. And no, no, you, no, you can only do pattern-based rules. You can't do rules based on literals. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we could fake it. So we could do that'll work, I think. Oh no, it won't. So what, what we could do is we could start with um. You can have a one self comma, one comma. Yeah, well, one comma one comma one. Like there won't be any three edges in this graph. We make the three edge be the the way yes, of uniquely identifying this... the master. Fine. I mean, that, then we can do something where we basically say, I mean, this is again, you know, this is sort of hackery here, but we can do this and then we can just say that's just X and this yeah, isn't exactly. pattern rules anymore. This is just ordinary rules. Yeah. Um, uh, so the count should be one, one. It should be just one because otherwise it keeps much into itself indefinitely. Uh, okay. okay. Did, no, but how do we prevent? How do we prevent the children from becoming? Oh, because they're not zero edges. I see. And it's not X. Well, okay, X goes away. Yeah. So the Steven, conditions should be one on one. Yeah, but don't do that because, as Max pointed out, we don't even need that. Um, well, what is this? Because it'll it keeps repeating. <laughs> so if we don't want that one one one, just do one. It'll work, as Max pointed out. He, his intuition is obviously much better than mine for the stuff. We got some interesting comments on the live stream about the IOTA blockchain and how it works, how things work there. We'll look at those in a moment. Hmm. Um, okay, the initial state should really be single edge one one one. What you're again? doing now is very weird. What's that? Single edge one put, one one. What do you put, mean? Put the initial state. In oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I filled in the wrong thing here. I was doing. I was doing that. Okay, the initial 
state is what? A single edge no, one. You, this is a thousand around. <laughs> I'm just, what, are, I'm, what are those? Uh, what are those disconnected causal graphs? I'm curious. Are those are those disconnected universes? Uh, yes. Yes. Those are. Uh, yes. And I mean, because the first rule input should also be level two. I'm sorry. What What are you saying? You're saying this here should be like this, right? Like that, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. There we go. No, okay. but. Do we want one one one, right? Do we? Yes, this right. is this is the correct this is the correct causal graph. Okay, great. Okay, so now we need the uh multiway. Um let's see, we can just say multiway system here, can't we, Jonathan? Uh with with the appropriate Wolfram model indicator, yep. Yeah. Does it need so what do we do? We say Wolfram Wolf model, model arrow. arrow. Okay. And you need one additional level of bracing in the uh, initial condition. Okay. And now. Can we just look at the, the states graph? Because we might be wrong. Like, I, I want to make sure it's correct before we ponder on the. I mean, multi way evolution graph. Sorry. This was very grim, what it just did there. Hold on. Okay, hold on. Let me just. Um... Ugh. Okay, yeah, this is good. Yeah, this is really good. So okay, in the so beginning, we have that. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, you explain it. Oh, I see. So that's in the beginning, Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so now, can you do the multi-way states graph? Because that'll show us all the ways that the children could count. This is the multi-way count. states graph. This but is but the multi -way no, 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 no. No, no. It, it includes step number, uh, it, sorry, includes state ID true. Here. Right. Okay, cool. So okay, yeah, so these are all the ways to these are all the ways to arrive at the correct count. Now the thing is that are you sure it's not applying as many different independent things as it can at once? It's not. It's applying one event at a time. Because they, they should merge, right? That where that why are the two is not merging. Well, I suppose it's because we because we included the state ID. ID. Yeah. So, so when you said that to false, yeah, go ahead. No, but but they're, this they're is all a great isomorphic. example. The, yeah. the, the state equivalence function is uh, isomorphism. Okay. Uh, so, so I see. So to to actually show what I was expecting, which is literally a lattice, we would have to have the children be distinguished. That's what we would have to have. Indeed, which then, which they're not at the moment. Okay, I right, see. But so, so here, let, let, let's look at the evolution, um, evolution events graph. Okay, so that's just showing how it got to that state, right? It's just showing each event that occurred, mm. and the causal graph is going to be similarly quite trivial, I think. Okay, what the heck is going on here? There were three different ways to count, to have one child count, and then two different ways after that to have the next child count. But why are, are they? All, why are they both? Yeah. Why, yeah, why are they all coming from the, the root? Well, the root does affect everything. Yes, yeah, so and these are, are all independent. Then, these are independent, not. I think. What? Oh, they are. Is it, the, it's yeah. doing transitive reduction. And it does a causal that? states graph. Well, do, do you know what it is? It's it's that the um it's that self edges as a way of counting. It's, we've you know we've encoded the the um, associativity directly, which means that those guys, the children, don't influence each other just because they're adding. Yes. Uh, a self edge that's totally independent of all the other self edges. I think this is that's why you see example. these are all so I think this encapsulates a lot of things that I think to, to do nice experiments we're going to need to change about how things work because we've highlighted a couple of things one is that the, the children shouldn't be identified they should have their own identity right even though they're all acting the same we do want to see the fact that some children can you know do things before other children and keep that different 
Well, we've got the state ID so, notion, but the, the problem is that this, when you say child, you imagine that there's a processor that keeps its identity, whereas here, every every state, every state of a processor is its own thing. Well, uh, okay, so potentially one thing that might at least illustrate part of what I think what Tali is talking about would be the the full evolution graph. Okay. So what do I do here? Full evolution graph? Uh, I think it's evolution graph full. Let me just double check. Yeah, evolution graph full. Hmm. So, this so, is, what... so this is not, not merging edges, not measure, merging evolution edges. OK, so there's three ways that the children could have like who got there first, basically to add one to the parent. Exactly. And then after that, there is there should be six, I guess. Why six? Because there are three ways to for for, to, to get for the first one, and then two ways to select the second. Ah, yes, of course. Yeah, exactly. It's it, it, what we're doing. We're just do, we're basically plotting out the choose function, or yeah. some variant of the choose function. Right. Okay, but, but so, well, go ahead. So, so, so my my claim would be that um, because I mean, you think about like the, the different ways that you could define things like the causal graph, like what the sites are, what space, you know, what elements are involved in a particular rewrite. And so this example of using solve edges for counting is bad because it doesn't communicate the fact that, you know, when you add something, it kind of does depend on what was there before. You know, the final answer does depend on what was there before, even though, um, you know, it's an abelian operation or it's, it's an associative operation, right? So that's, that's one thing where if we explicitly modeled vertices as having state, we could, um, we could capture that in a way that these self edges can't capture. And the well, other would be that yeah. individual pr processes really should have their own identity attached to them for the purposes of collapsing states together. Well, you're saying that a point in space-time, basically, could have a label. Beyond us saying, I mean, in, you know, what leads to relativity in some sense is that the points in space-time do not have labels and that all that matters is the causal graph. But you're saying, let's give them a label because they are, after all, processor ID number such and such made of, you know, with this particular microprocessor inside it, so to speak. And therefore, it is not the case. Sure. That, you know, that it's mere, at least for the purposes of visualization, so to speak, it's worth identifying it's that processor with that piece of silicon in it. Even though logically, mm -hmm. when we are trying to understand how the programming works, it may not matter that it's a processor with that particular piece of silicon. Hardware is a coordinate choice. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. true. Now, now, you're right that in general it might not matter. Um, and we might sometimes want to see those different children as being completely equivalent. And it's just the kind of statistics of the states that they're in that we care about. But when we analyze individual evolutions, we really do want to trace out that, you know, client one did something, then client two did something that's different from client two doing the thing first and then client one doing it after. So I think we, we want that flexibility either way, right? Hey, let, let's, I'm just looking at some things on our live stream here. I want to comment. Hans Moog says, in the IOTA blockchain, we're using something we call parallel reality-based ledger state. It's a multi-way graph that encodes all possible outcomes of ledger state modifications at the same time. OK, great. Um, all these realities coexist next to each other and are all equally valid if they are causally consistent. So that would, that's a branch-like hypersurface in a globally hyperbolic multi-way evolution graph. That is the claim here, yes. OK, consensus now means we perform a measurement, i.e. we count votes of the network participants rating, regarding which reality they have seen first. This makes these realities collapse into a single shared state among all participants. Consensus is therefore equivalent to classicality, where performing a measurement commits you to a certain branch in the multi-way graph. Interesting. Um, all this is enabled by not aggregating transactions in a block, but having them separated as single individual vertices in the graph that only have causal references to their depending inputs. Well, that's interesting. That's really cool. Yeah, that's oh, really cool. Very analogous to what we're talking about. 
I thought we thought there was an analogy. Thank you. Yes. I mean, so so let's try to understand. Um, hmm. You just got to plan your network, so now we'll have your buzzword thing go. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I know, I know, I know. That that was my my last April Fool's Day thing about um, blockchain and quantum mechanics. That's really embarrassing. That that may actually turn out to be correct. <laughs> that is so shocking. Well, well, um, I've been, I've been, I've been wondering. I don't want to derail things, but like in the in the sort of quantum computing formalism, where you just imagine like qubits and their, you know, mixed and pure states and a set of gates that are transforming them. Do we know what that looks like in terms of a multi-way evolution system or something similar? Yes, I think so. And in fact, Jonathan, I was going to ask you whether Ruhi had managed to do the um, uh, the Shor's algorithm in the multi-way formalism. Uh, not yet, in large part because I ha we, we have it in the in the actual QC framework she's implemented it, but I haven't implemented the appropriate converter yet. But walk through for Tally how that. I mean, maybe you can show. Can, can you show it in our quantum computing framework just for a second, just so we get a sense something real, and then then we can talk about how it might look in the multi-way case. Uh, wait, what 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 would you like me to show? I'm confused. Well, for that. example, Shaw's algorithm. Uh, I I don't have that code on hand. Okay. Or I don't have the latest well, version. I mean, even something simpler. So like, if you have, do we model, like how do we model a qubit? Cause you've got to obviously have, you know, you need its, um, its position on the block sphere. And like, what is that? What does that correspond to in the branch space picture? Uh, so, I mean, a single qubit. Well, Jonathan, do you want to, do you want to say what, I mean, I think a single qubit corresponds to a, hmm. Well, like, like, let, let, let's let's okay. say you're doing a Hadamard, let's say you're doing a Hadamard gate, right? And you've got to change. I can't remember which way around it is, but like zero into zero plus one, and one into zero minus one. Um, what is the picture of that in terms of like you know edges and vertices and and whatever? Like, what's the basis? Uh, okay, do you, do you want me to take this one? Yes. Okay, yeah, so, so, sure. So, so a, 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 this because you're about to write you're about to write a compiler that does this. So I'm hoping you understand it. Right, right. So a qubit is, is uh, in its simplest formulation would just be a pair of vertices in the multi-way evolution graph, right? One corresponding to ket zero, one corresponding to ket one. Uh, the phase obviously then dictated by the angle that of of the of that the 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 angle of the geodesic that, that describes the uh, or th that ma that maps the initial state onto that state in the multi-way evolution graph, and then it's it's uh, norm squared, then given by the the uh, multi-way path weight. Let Let's look at that a little bit more carefully. Okay, so you're saying, I mean, you're saying the the zero in the computational basis. Say, say again what you just said. You're saying yeah. that the go ahead. Well, a, a qubit has two consists of two eigenstates. Yes. That's all I'm saying. Ket zero, ket one. So it corresponds to a pair of vertices in the multi-way evolution graph. Okay. So, okay. So you're saying, all right. So then, okay. Those are two different vertices. Now let's talk about, um, I mean, in terms of a quantum superposition depends on the sort of delivery of amplitude to those two positions in the multi-way graph. Right, that that determines the amplitude associated with each of those states, is, you know, is the what, path weight. Right. Well, together. So, yeah. Well, that's that's the thing, right? We've got to do the uh, the phase as well. The phase has to come in. Right. the The phase is determined by what. I mean, the the current understanding is, the path weight determines the modulus, the the magnitude, and. Mm. The phase is determined by whether those GD6, uh, where those GD6 land. So, in other words, they're actually two separate things. There's the there's the flow of magnitude, which is path weights, and mm -hmm. then there's the um, did did it actually land on that node in the multiway graph or not, or did the mm, GD6 yeah. get turned in a different direction? And that's yeah. the, that's the phase. So so. If we think about a single qubit and the kinds of things you could do to a single qubit, I think this is really, really informative, right? Because I think Jonathan's right. You've got a, 
uh, zero vertex and one vertex at the top, right? I, I'm now thinking about like a Deutsch kind of quantum circuit, right? And then you've got yeah, a, zero, so. a, a zero and a one at the bottom. And really you just can't, I mean, like you do one operation, you just like, it's just distributing kind of weights uh, from that zero and one at the top to the zero and one at the bottom, right? Well, I, so, so a question is, in the multi-way graph, so this is a this is a question for Jonathan. In the multi-way graph, what does what does a random, you know, Hadamard gate look like in the multi-way graph? A collection of evolution edges that connect to neighboring branch-like hypersurfaces, as opposed to a measurement gate which would connect points on the same branch-like hypersurface. Can we be more explicit? Can can we um than um, what? Than that. In other words, what? so you're saying given you know, I'm going to draw a multi-way graph, which is which would have, you know, I'm going to have these nodes. Um, uh, Do you have your camera that points at your desk? Now, me, now would yes, be the I, time. I, I do. Yeah. It's it's my desk is covered in junk here. So right, but I mean, yeah. any multi-way evolution graph will illustrate that, right? That the, the the collection of evolution edges that separate two branch-like hypersurfaces can be considered a an well, what in our quantum computing framework would be a quantum discrete operator. And any collection of evolution edges that connect points on the same branch like hypersurface would correspond to a quantum measurement operator. Okay, but but let's be explicit. For a Hadamard gate, what is it going to look like? Uh, well, hang on. So Hadamard is what? Uh, remind me what the sequence I of zero is. What it is. I, I was hoping you so, were going to remember that, but I don't remember what that particular one is. Um, Hadamard is, is zero to zero one, zero plus, so zero to zero yep. plus one. Maybe, and maybe, then, can, can we just pull up the quantum computing framework, Jonathan? Did, did yeah, I mean, have we, do you have the notebook on you? The the the, 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 the WO file. Well, I I might do. I might be able to find it. But but I mean, if you can send it, that would be easier. But I can I can probably find it. Um, okay. Hold on. This uh, quantum computing. Here we go. January thirtieth with our last review of it. Um. January twenty twenty. Quantum dot Is that what I should run? Okay, run all code. Oh, for goodness sake, some weird shadowing messages. Okay, why are you sending me here? Okay. Um, okay, so tell me what to run here. So that, let, let's actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna quit and rerun this because I'm concerned about those shadowing messages. Uh, th those are th those are probably bugs in quantum.wl. There were a bunch of things that were that, that were giving shadowing messages, which I've now fixed. But it's okay, fine. fine. The... I don't think that's on your end. Okay, all right. Well, anyway, I'm, I've got a clean run here. Okay, so now what do I do here? Well, quantum discrete operator Hadamard comma one. Okay, you know this framework infinitely better than I do. That's quantum okay. discrete operator Hadamard list one or list yeah okay list one will do. No, no, no. Uh, the, the Hadamard doesn't have to be in the list. Just list one for the, the wire position. Okay. Okay. Mm. And so now, can I can I turn that into an actual matrix or something? Yep. Uh, matrix representation. Okay. Okay. One Hadamard gate. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, given this Hadamard gate, how do we get what is the um, uh, multi-way graph that corresponds to that Hadamard gate? Easy. Okay. So um, we. So the first thing we want to do is just take uh, the two states. We, I mean, because this is an arity zero. Uh, sorry, an arity one gate. That's really easy. We just take ket zero, ket one. And we want to see how that matrix acts on ket zero, ket one. So we can take a quantum discrete state uh, of. Well, we can take two quantum discrete states. One, one being ket zero, one being ket one, and then just see how Hadamard applies to it. So what do I do? I just to uh, say zero there, or what? Uh, no, you, you do a list of one zero and, and one one. That one is one zero, and the other one is one one. Mm -hmm. What does the one zero mean? That's just oh, the, that would be a cat zero in the computational basis. Oh, okay, fine. One, no, I mean, no, that should be zero mean, zero one. Yeah, yeah, zero one. Zero, so yeah, yeah, so, right, whatever. Okay. I mean, if, uh, and if you if you go through and you uh, if you map. Um, percent amplitudes if you sorry if you, if you do hash amplitudes mapped over that you can actually you should be able to see those bases uh, as in hash square uh, square bracket amplitudes that's equivalent isn't it isn't that the oh, is it, uh, oh yeah okay, sorry it's the tally yeah, yeah 
It's the tally syntax. <laughs> the tally syntax. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, no! It's not, an, it's not an association. It's a it's a subject. Yeah, yeah, right. So sorry. Tally syntax is not universal. So. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. Okay. Um, right. So that, and so then we can just apply that QDS to those two states and see what you get. And whatever that notation is that the zeros are surrounding are surrounded by is very confusing in, when, <laughs> next yeah, to the I know. association. Was, when when Dirac funny. invented that in the 1930s, he wasn't thinking of associations. <laughs> the, um, that, I mean, uh, no, no, so that you should map work. them over the states. What's that? You should map them over the states, percent 140, not over the amplitudes. And you shouldn't map matrix representation, you should map the operator. That you should apply the operator to the state. Okay, and now I can do the same thing. This amplitudes for this, right? Yep. And so that should give me the result of the Hadamard gate. Uh huh. Okay, dandy. Right. Okay. Okay. So now, now uh, if we, so all this is really saying is that uh, vertex. So it's saying if you have ket, how would we do this? Um, these are hard to do in one's head. Uh, so I, I was actually playing with this. I was playing with this just before the meeting, and I'm not suggesting that I have the answer, but I have something that looks right, and it demands that um, that we actually enlarge the states a little bit. It's not just zero one. Um, that there's actually kind of phase comes in as a state. So there's zero one, and then there's like you know, um, minus zero, minus one, if you want to think of it like that. Um, and then, then Hadamard has a simple interpretation as it's just like, it just crosses things over in a certain twisty way that is kind of obvious once you draw a picture. I don't know how we're going to draw a picture. But if you think the, trouble's, that mi the no. trouble's the minus, that minus is a different branch, right? It's sending zero to zero and one, and it's sending um, one to zero and one, but a different one, right? It's not the, like, the cool thing is everything's integers in this picture. It's all about weights in the end. There's no actual cancellation. As you say, cancellation is just that edges ended up, weight ended up in a place that you're not measuring, right? Yes. And, and I think that that would be achieved, if it is achieved, by there being um, like another, like a, almost, almost like a gauge group, I suppose. I'm, so I probably shouldn't use that word, but I don't really understand it. But like those, um, the computational basis has these extra dimensions that you have to represent in the multi-way evolution graph. And at the very end, when you do a measurement, you're just like ignoring those. You're collapsing, you're identifying zero and minus zero and I zero and minus I zero as all being zero. I'm not sure you need that, but I understand what you're saying. But I think that that's squashing what would otherwise be branch-like separated things. You're trying to represent them on a... Um, I don't think you need that. Um, okay. Because I don't see what that minus, you see, you've got, so just think of like, draw a little picture of like a little node called zero and a node called one, and then yeah. underneath another, another node called zero and another node called one. Okay. And okay. just imagine how to connect them. Like, what is this rewrite doing for Hadarad? And it's obvious what the zero does. It's just an arrow down and an arrow to the, to the right. But what is the one doing? Okay, wait a minute. I think Jonathan has an actual way of, of thinking about this compilation. Maybe Jonathan could explain that. Well, so if you want to represent a negative amplitude, I mean, the easiest way to do it is to introduce an annihilation state. So, you'd so I mean, if you wanted to represent this as a string re rewrite, this would correspond to, uh, in this particular case, you're saying zero goes to zero, one. And then for the second case, you want to say something like one goes to one, two, for instance, where two is an annihilation state. And then you have a pair of replacement operations that say one, two, and two, one both go to the empty string. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. I have a, I have a basic logistical question, right? So, as I understand it, you were about, you are about to write a compiler from uh, the quantum, this quantum framework to multiway systems. Is that a true statement? Yes. How is it going to work? Uh, well, using this 
translation technique, right? That 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 every every gate is a collection of evolution edges connecting two neighboring branch-like hypersurfaces, and every measurement is a collection of edges connecting points. Okay, but can, can we be okay? So wait a minute. So so the claim is each gate connects. Okay, so you're saying gates measurement operators, gate operators and measurement operators. Mm -hmm. Okay, so say say that again. So a gate right. operator. So, I mean, here would be the. I mean, this is the way to do it that I just laid out. Um, Ah, what's it doing? Oh, there we go. Okay, explain. Oops, maybe we probably want you to have a layered graph plot. Okay, explain. Right. So as I mean, we, we know from the representation above that ket zero maps to uh, some equal superposition of ket zero and ket one, which is all the first rule is saying. And ket one maps to an equal superposition of ket zero and the annihilator of ket one, which I'm here representing as two. And then we're just saying. So explain this picture. What what is this picture supposed to be a picture of? Is this a Hadamard gate or is this something completely different? What is it? It's it? a it's a it's a single state with a collection of Hadamard gates being applied to it. Oh, well, I mean, it's a little bit complicated because, of course, the annihilation operations are not part of the actual Hadamard gate. They're something else. But um, wait a minute. Wait 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 wait. What what? Okay. I completely don't understand what's going on here. So. The, walk me through. So, so the zero and the one here are oh. So, so maybe what I should do is make a multi-way graph starting from both a zero and a one. Just that way, I could should should be able to see. Oh gosh, I'm confused here. I am unbelievably confused. What? Why? In this multi-way system, why am I not seeing two sources here? Why Which, I mean, you that? would you would if you ran it for fewer evaluation steps. If you ran it for one evaluation step, you would not see two sources. You would you sorry, you would see two sources. Oh, this is a states graph. So yes. the, yeah, that's that's the problem. The problem is the states graph ended oh, up with the one there. Okay, so so what do I want to do? I want to do an evolution. What is it called? You can do an evolution graph if you don't want it to merge. That's what I want. Steps. That's what I want. That's what I want. There we go. Okay. So now, can you explain this picture? Um, which part from the beginning? Because I'm utterly confused. Right. So we, okay, we have we have a Hadamard gate. It's acting on ket zero and ket one. Okay. So with ket, with the ket zero case, it replaces it with a, with an equal superposition of ket zero and ket one. Okay. And with the ket one case, it replaces it with an equal superposition of ket zero and the annihilator uh, the annihilator state for ket one. Let's call the annihilator. So, so we're so we're not so confused. Let's call it X just for fun. Okay, just so so that we so we recognize that that's not a state of the same character as the other ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, now again I'm confused. So so I would have thought that the superposition will be two separate states in the multiway system, not a single state with two pieces in it. Uh, you could also represent it that way, but the the, the point is that. In the end, it doesn't really matter because the it, because the updating events only apply at the level of single cats. A you know two, two strings concatenated will behave the same as you know as two separate strings. Could, could strings are really inappropriate. Strings inappropriate for this because it's just like right. there's no notion of space here. <laughs> like there's just different qubits, right? Right. right. So can we can we do it with lists instead of with with with? Can we have a case here where every string is just a single character can we can we can we make that work or is that not do, do you see what i'm asking uh yes can we, can we do that in this case i mean so so that we can explicitly see that zero turns into the superposition of zero and one so as i would understand it that would be i would have another rule that says zero goes, goes to, to one yeah zero, so goes, zero to zero. goes to zero in that case right zero goes to zero zero goes to one or am i confused no, no, that, that's good. Okay, so there we go. So that's making that superposition. Okay, now what do I do for the other pieces here? How do I get? Well, what, one goes to zero, uh, one goes to x. Okay, so those are now separate. So let's let's do that. 
Okay, now what do I want? I just want to say uh, X goes to nothing. Is that right? Uh, no, because, I mean, well, I mean, let's ju uh, just eliminate the annihilation stuff for the moment. As a, no, no, as in eliminate the, the last two rules. Then we can worry about exactly how we interpret it later. Okay, all right, so let's go through this now. Okay, so let's say we start off with a, a, a pure state. I'm going to start with a pure state that's just a zero, right? Pure state that's just a zero. What happens next is we get a superposition of zero and one, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, now what is our gate supposed to be doing? So now we have, we have something that is, if we imagine a GDSIC here, let's, let's evolve this for another step. So a GDSIC will go down, you know, down this in some way. Right. And what we're asking for is what is the amplitude? What amplitudes do these things have? So the answer is there's a path weighting that tells us how many paths get there. And there is also the question of um, the GD6 could wind up in the annihilator state, thereby taking, you know, effectively taking amplitude away from the zero and one states. Is that right? Right, right. So, I mean, if we wanted to model this properly, you know, in, in this single character representation, then the way to, the way to do that would be to um, do what Tali suggested and to have uh, negations of zero and one that also have, you know, the associated Hadamard rules. I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really simple. Like, so, so, so the, um, it's not just zero and one. It's like the, you actually do need to model the whole block sphere, right? Like the complex phase is not there in amplitudes. It's there in the states. And yes. they just flow around, they swirl around in a weird way, such that they get concentrated in various places. And, and at the end, when you project, uh, you can see what looks like cancellation. It's just that things got funneled into you, essentially universes that you're not in, right? Yes. <laughs> so I mean, so, so right. So, so you're saying that we should represent, I mean, we're, we're going to discretize our block sphere, but it's not good enough to just have zero one discretization. How many, yeah. how many, so how many I, states do we have to have in the block sphere? I haven't figured that out, but I can say that for at least for Hadamard, um, you need four states to represent a qubit, at least. I imagine you need more, right? But there's this weird thing that like, you know, there's this extra degree of freedom that's not real. Um, so I haven't figured that out. But I can tell you what the exact transition is. It's it's really simple. As a diagram, it's really simple. Yeah. So you start with drawing zero, zero and minus zero at the top, and one and minus one at the top. Don't do it as a as a string substitution system. I don't think that will help. I wanted to actually because then we, if we do it as string substitution, we can a we can automatically get the picture drawn, but b we can see what the consequences are if we go further. We could do it as a list. I substitution don't think system if you have an objection. What, what's that? As which? You could do it as a list substitution system if you have an objection to string. I don't know. No, I, I don't think that's Tally's just... issue. I, I think Tally's issue is he just wants to draw a picture. Okay, so let's yeah, just it's just a really picture. simple picture. Okay, let's just draw a picture then. Okay, so okay, picture coming up. What do you want in the picture? So we're going to have two groups of vertices: one at the top and one at the bottom. And the one at the top will be you know, the qubit before we apply the gate, and at the one at the bottom will be the qubit after we apply the gate. Okay. 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 What do you want me to draw? You want me to draw how many vertices? Um, four. So draw them, not like that, not on a line, but in a little square, like slightly offset, you know, like an isometric square. You mean like this? It'll become, yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah. I don't want to be too fussy, but okay. Tally, can you can you pick, move that up, can you move that bottom up, one? Pick up the zoom uh, thing and just draw it. You you can do, um, do you, uh, you go into the that. more and you go to where do you go? You go to annotate, and you can start scribbling all over the screen. I don't see that. I think I might have to share first, and then. Um, no, you shouldn't have to. It should be in the. Um, well, you, you can share if you want to, but I, I think it should allow you to annotate without sharing. So you, I click you, more. Where, no, you don't, more? You, don't, you don't need to click more. It should be in the main bar. 
Okay, mm-hmm. guys, do, does anybody else that. know how to do this? Oh, it's saying view options at the top. Ah, uh, okay, view options, annotate. Okay, now you can oh, start cool. scribbling all over the screen. And I can scribble on your screen. Yes, you can scribble on That's the screen. An... We all see. It's, it's That's very shocking. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to do it like this. Um, this is terrible because I have a touchpad, so it's even worse than if I had a mouse. And then we're going to do the same thing down here. And I probably need to have made these bigger. But um, so this is the this is zero and one. Mm-hmm. And if you want to do it like that. And um, this is going to be it's like minus, minus zero. OK, so um, here's what happens. Um, we know that zero goes to zero, also goes to one. Um, this guy, what happens to this guy? Well, we know it goes to one. Oh, sorry. Uh, how do I undo? Oh, there we go. So we know it goes to zero. That's the same in both pictures. But where does this arrow go? Well, it goes over here. Okay. Uh, actually, I think that's wrong. I think it needed to go down rather than across. And the point is that this is one axis, this is one kind of axis of the block sphere, and this is the zero one computational basis. And if you if you aggregate, if you coarse grain in this direction, then you, you're doing a measurement in the computational basis. And then this, this, um, this axis here is not observable, obviously, because um, that's just a phase difference. Now, I can fill in these other things in the same way, but you'll just notice that they cross over in the obvious way to preserve the total yeah, probability. Um, probability. Yeah, total right. Pathway. So the, so this is just mixing. It's just rotating some of these edges, some of the weights into this other, you know, like parallel universe, so to speak. Um, and I guess the claim would be that, you know, when you build a quantum circuit, you're just kind of like corralling these weights around. Um, such that when you make a final projection at the end, it's done something a little bit interesting. Exactly. Now, yes. But if what's and, and I, th- I think with this picture, you might need to add some more states to have the full um, degrees of freedom of the block sphere. I'm not sure, and there might be a more natural representation that doesn't use zero and one. I, I don't know. But um, what's weird about this is that it would really disagree about how powerful quantum computers are with the kind of standard view. So I, I kind of feel like this must be missing something because. Um, the total Why? What is it like state space. Yeah. Well, it's saying that that you can whatever the Hilbert space that this is representing is not as high dimensional as what as is commonly assumed, right? Because normally it's like two to the n, the number of qubits, yes. but this is less than that. So it's saying that you can do cool things, but you can't do the cool like the uber cool things that you know you well, see. would the, say that you can look, do. The basic problem with quantum computing is corralling those two to the n different sort of possible superpositions down to something where you have, you know, where you've concentrated amplitude in the result that you want to have. I mean, I, I, I don't know what, you know, let me take a picture of your, I'm, I'm, I'm screen capturing. Now you can delete your thing and I'll put it back in this notebook. Okay, if you, if you erase okay, cool. it. Yep. Yeah, done, yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, and uh, so it's a terrible picture, but you, I think you get what I was trying to say that this is like crossover of the, the way it. that weights are being redistributed. Yeah. Meanwhile, Jonathan has just put something in chat. So let me see whether what what is Jonathan's thing here. Uh, the thing I was tr- trying to explain earlier. And is that related to what Tally was explaining or not? Uh, no, because it doesn't involve discretizing the block sphere. It uses the um, interpretation of amplitudes and, and uh, phases that we I thought we had figured out earlier. Okay, let's go through this one and get Tally to understand this one. And then let's see what... Uh, okay, Jonathan, explain your... Can I, can I run it for another step or will it go bonkers? Yeah, if of I, course. It doesn't go bonkers? No, it shouldn't do. 
and okay. just keep doing similarish things. Okay, so explain what this is doing now. Uh, well, it's it's using our old. It's you know, so Tally has, as far as I can tell, presented a new way you could represent quantum mechanical systems in the context of multi-wave evolution, um, okay. which is a more direct translation of the conventional quantum mechanical formalism. It's just that you you're um, you're applying linear operators with evolution edges rather than with matrices. Okay, so explain yours here. Well, this is our, this is our old interpretation. There's there's nothing new to explain. I mean, this is just superpositions. Explain it for Tally's benefit and explain it for my benefit because I assume I'm confused. Okay, uh, so here, okay, go ahead. Yeah. So we've right, got so, states. So we have a superposition of different eigenstates, which are ket zero and ket one. Yep. And then there's a set of replacement operations governed by the Hadamard gate rules that dictate how you how you, how those evolve. Okay, but, but so we start with a superposition here. We mm -hmm. get a superposition here. Right. And where do we see the result from the Hadamard gate? The, what, what do you mean by see the result? I mean, the, the result is the, is the, you know, the consequence of those evolution. You know, as I say, the, the gate is the collection of evolution edges that connect the two branch-like hypersurfaces. And so, the, so the, the resultant branch-like hypersurface is the outcome of that gate. So, How do we recover the measurement probabilities that we expect from a Hadamard gate, or at least the projections of the computational basis? So you then have to do the completion procedure, and and in fact, does you that be, work? Does that does that produce the numbers that we need? Yes, it, it, because of the because of the amplitude interpretation. So in fact, okay, it's a, bit, a little bit complicated because you actually have to apply all possible completion procedures, um, you know, in, in all possible orders, and then if you do that, because the the uh, Amplitudes are given by the collection of evolution paths, or the, the number of evolution paths. The probabilities you you get out are equivalent to the. I think it will be it. interesting to see this, but this is get, this is getting us off track for what we were originally doing. But I think that would be super interesting to see. I mean, no, you, I, I agree. I agree. Did, did did you do that computation or not yet? Yeah, yeah, but I, I don't I, I don't have it. I didn't realize that for this meeting I needed to have the quantum compiler actually working. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, we just uh, uh, right, but, but I think I, I I can send over some working notebooks that I have for that right now. Or uh, yeah, general. let me see if I can fish them out. Okay, but so I mean, your claim, Jonathan, is that with this method, when you add completions to basically get causal invariance, you can make something where you can take an arbitrary set of quantum gates and compile it to multi-way systems. Is that a true yes. statement? Right, right. And so, the, so, the, so in, in the interpretation I th thought we were using, the block sphere is a branch-like hypersurface. There's no need to discretize the block sphere. Right. You mean okay. a branch-like hypersurface that is one of these that goes across here somehow? Yeah, right, right. But so wait, if, if you take... Yep, sorry. So, so, but, but, so if you're going to measure, um, and you're going to measure with respect to a certain a kind of angle on the block sphere, vector on the block sphere, mm -hmm. that gives you one branch like hypersurface. Is that what you're saying? Not quite. No, 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 no. no. So, so if, imagine you have a multi base. Okay, it's a little bit complicated because you have the A's and B's here, which I'm using hackily to represent the inverses of uh, ket zero and ket one. Um, or the negations of ket zero and ket one, and in, if I did this more completely, we wouldn't have to do that. But um, so suppose you have a multi-way evolution graph that just contains zeros and ones. You can take a branch-like hypersurface through that. You can, you know, you can then you can then infer the amplitudes by counting the path weights. Uh, you can infer the uh, phases by then looking at the, the geodesic, you know, the angles of geodesics that lead to the zero and to the one. So from that, you can construct your discrete approximation to the block sphere. If you then want to measure it a particular with respect to a particular vector on the block sphere, as you say, that vector will now define a new geodesic uh, in, in in the multi-way evolution graph. And so that so then that geodesic it allows you to define a branch-like hypersurface with with respect to which you can then perform the completion. And that's your that's your sort of. Uh, your measurement. I mean, it sounds like you have a. It sounds like you have a very complete picture in your head, um, which is great. I don't think I fully understand it yet. Um, I think we I need to like actually to. see the compiler. I mean, that that that's the way we're going to understand this. To okay, be able sure. to take something with a bunch of gates and see it compile and see how. I mean, I think that's going to be very compelling and interesting to see that. Mm. Um, right. And that sounds like a 
an important thing to try to achieve here. Can I make a claim? So this might be premature, but if that picture that I was presenting above is, is a fruitful way of, of kind of embedding quantum computing into this sort of framework, um, I mean, that would be very interesting. Um, but it would, it would also suggest a reason why um, it kind of like feels like you should get exponential speed ups from quantum computers, but in practice you never do, like that hasn't been demonstrated. And it's, it actually relates to something very traditional from, in computer science, which is dynamic programming. So if you think about the two ways that you can implement some tricky algorithm that involves touching what seems like a, you know, what, what technically is an exponential number of states, um, it's often the case that like some of them are shared, like they're not, sure. it's not really exponential. And when you switch to the dynamic programming interpretation, it, you almost turn the algorithm inside out and you see, um, you compute um, what in this case are, are actually the path weights and you just propagate those forward. You've chosen the right frame, so to speak, to make the computation um, much more manageable to kind of control the evaluation front of the computation so that everything is sort of nice and easy to compute. And um, like a good example is just like, you know, you take something like um, Fibonacci, you know, like the traditional, the classic recursive thing is like horrible, but if you just arrange the way that you've, you've ordered the computation, it becomes linear. And right. so if this picture is true, then there's something very, there's a very cool interpretation of the, the sort of exponential versus only, only um, polynomial speed ups of quantum computers. It's that if you take the dynamic programming view of what a quantum computer is doing, then it's, it's not exponential, right? You can solve it more cheaply than that by keeping track of these running weights, which is well, what I claim this picture of, right. of quantum gates is doing. Okay, but, but so, so to make that more explicit, so I mean, in our view of, of how quantum mechanics works in multi-way systems and so on, the, you know, what you, uh, let, me, let me say a version of what you said, okay? The version mm -hmm. would be, there is a foliation of that multi-way system that makes it look like you're following exponential numbers of paths. But there's another foliation, another evaluation front in which it reve it's revealed to you that actually you don't need to follow an exponential number of paths. So said a different way, I mean, I think the thing, you know, causal invariance implies, mm. you know, when you think you're treeing out all those different cases, causal invariance implies that you're actually not. Exactly, you're redundancies, not. yes. Yes, yeah. causal invariance implies that in the end, you know, you're going to get a, a single objective reality, so to speak. And mm. even though the formalism says that you tree out everything. Exactly, and, yes, yeah, exactly. I mean, so, I so these path yeah. weights are just a cheap, they're a cheap way of, of capturing that redundancy so that you can just do them one by one. And by the, see, by the time you get to the end, you've got something that's much less than two to the end, right? Like that full matrix that, that linearly sure. connects the, yes. the uh, occupancy on the initial states and the occupancy on the final states is like, it's pretty simple compared to what it could be. Um, no, right, and of course, experience implies that that is the, that that can happen, right? That you don't need to do, that you can pick a different foliation effectively for evaluating things which will not be like the exponential Fibonacci case. Didn't we already yes. prove this? We already discussed this. I wouldn't use the word prove, but we definitely already discussed this. I thought I proved that if you take the finitely presented transition monoid of a quantum Turing machine and you apply a kinetic completion procedure to it, it becomes a transition function for a Turing machine. Which is another way of saying that any redundancy that isn't introduced by the actual rule is introduced by your measurement procedure. So that by the, by the time your completion is over, the thing is classically computable. Okay. okay, the claim there is, if you take a quantum Turing machine and yeah. you add completions, to make it causal invariant, then you, you can have a system where you have no redundancy, in which case that then you, you genuinely do have an exponential Hilbert space. But the point is in order for you to agree on the outcome of the computation, 
you then have to introduce redundancy by performing a measurement. And any, so any redundancy that didn't exist in the rule set is introduced by the measurement. Well, in your interpretation of measurement, yes. Which is, which, which, so you're saying, I mean, either way, you end up with causal invariance. Either you end up with it because the observer is inserting completions, or you end up with it because that's how the underlying rules work. Right. But, but you're saying, once there is causal invariance in the whole thing, I mean, yes, we're all saying the same thing here. Once there's causal invariance, it implies that, um, you know, that there's vastly more redundancy than you would think yeah. based on treeing out all the possibilities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've just got to pick the right representation for that redundancy to become explicit, which it feels like this... I mean, the thing is that like, what, str what I struggle with this is like, this picture is very linear, what I just drew on the screen. If like, if, if you can see a quantum circuit, it's just doing this. I mean, surely people have noticed this before and been like, oh, you know, they're not that powerful. <laughs> like, it doesn't feel plausible that this could be sort of a novel way of looking at- Well, I, I think the computer. problem is the formalism. I think we need to see Jonathan's um, quantum computing to multi-way compiler. Because I think then we're going to be able to actually understand, you know, we're going to be able to explicitly run Shaw's algorithm with its full sort of measurement story. Because, you know, the problem of typical quantum computing is, you know, one is carefully modeling all the gates, but the measurement is just a great big, you know, and then we measure it. But there's no micro understanding of the measurement. So do you think that's mm -hmm. a fair statement, Jonathan? Yeah, sure. I mean, and if you want to see it working, I mean, I think that's what my example shows. We always have a hard time understanding. Right. Okay, Jonathan, so, explain so your you, example again. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, if you want to trace it out explicitly, you, you, we can do the computation manually. If you apply a quantum discrete operator Hadamard comma one to one to the state one one. Yeah, okay. Then then what? Then, then, then you're you'll saying- get, Then you'll get the state one zero, which we can just compute. Okay. Right. But how is well, that being represented in this picture? Well, hang on. Do we, do we agree? Hang on, if I- I can send through the code if you want. Yeah, okay. So then if you do okay. percent state vector or percent amplitudes. Amplitudes. Whichever you prefer. Okay. Okay, so we have, we have a one, zero and no ones, in other words in our okay. branch like hypersurface. So that's represented in this picture by the fact that we have, we have two edges going into zero, one edge going into a B, which is the negation of the one and one edge going into the one. So in reality, we just have two edges going into the zero. So in other words, we have, what, we have only zeros in our branch like hypersurface, right? Whoa, 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 That was a little too fast for me. We Wait started a from a linear what? superposition of one and zero. That's the QDS yes. one okay. one. Yep. And we have, the, we, have a, we have a branch like hypersurface containing two zeros, a B and a one. Two zeros. Two zeros. One. Where are the okay. two zeros? The two edges oh, lead. Oh, I, I see the two path weight two zeros. Yeah, we're talking about B amplitudes here. So, so yeah. we okay. path weights, right? So then the B and the one cancel out. So we're just left with two zeros, which normalizes to one zero, which is what we see here. So then, if you apply the QDO, if you apply QDO uh, to the to that discrete state again. Yes. Then, then you're saying, what's the A doing? Well, that's a negation of a zero. So let's let's try it again. What do you mean? Try running another step. Or just do the Hadamard gate again. Yeah. I mean, evolve to the next branch like hypersurface. You mean by by applying the Hadamard state thing twice here? Yeah. Which will, I mean, spoiler alert, it will take you back to the original state. But <laughs> yes. <laughs> just just okay. for the seeing as though you seem to like being explicit. Explicit, I do very much. <laughs> the only way I ever understand anything. Um. Okay, there we go. And now we amplitude. Again. I mean, if we had a more complicated gate, it would be more interesting. But, that, but that's... it would also be harder to analyze. Right. But anyway, okay. so, so then our third branch like hypersurface now contains two ones, two zeros, an A and a B. So the A, the A and B cancel out with one of the one, one, one and one zero. So we just left with a, a single one and a single. Wait, wait, wait. Can, can I write this in a different way? So that your B is a, is a negation of a one. Is that correct? Okay, so let's write it as a 1x. That's a bad a. idea. Why? Because the 1 is going to pattern match. Oh. Yeah. Do like... Um, hmm. 
You could do a Unicode thing, like a one with a bar on top of it. It's actually like combining a one in a string. A which? Can we do formal ones in strings? Does that work? I don't see why not. Is there a formal one? I, oh, no, there isn't a formal one. Never mind. Sorry. Um, what was that before? It was an A before. Well, sorry. Okay. Uh, what did I do wrong? Was that a B before? One goes to B. You have B as the, as the negation of the ones. Yes. Yeah, I think so. Right, you but have I, cyclic conditions because how is the A going to multiply? So the A is the annihilator of the zero. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, effectively, we, we, we have to do a, a post-processing step ju that just says any A's cancel out with zeros. Okay. Which is kind of hacky, but... A is the annihilator of zero, B is the annihilator of one. Right. But anyway, so you, but you see... Sorry? Well, well, the thing I don't really understand here is that they, they actually can't annihilate yet, right? Otherwise, this would just be a classical gate. They've got to like keep. No, they have. Going. They keep going. They keep going, and then they, then I think. I mean, this particular thing is just cyclic. Right, right. But then, the, yeah. And then the point is that the at the end, your measurement procedure has to basically say that um, an, a, 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 any uh, branch like you you can set up your completion in such a way that you say any completion a, any branch like hyperservice that contains an A and a zero is equivalent to the empty string. For instance. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. That's not very exciting there. Okay. Let's return to. But, to... It, it, but you, you now, you now seem at the point I was trying to make, right? That this, that this gives you all of the information you need. That this, this is how the compiler works. I want to see the compiler actually working. Did, okay. you, did you send me something? The... No, I mean, the, the, this is, I, I have similar examples to this for more complicated gates, but they all work in the. the, the, the if you want to see the compiler working, in a, in a sense, you just saw it. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I want to see a more sophisticated version of this because that's that way. But we'll get that. Okay. But let's come back to our distributed computing case. And, and you know, this sideshow was about the quantum computing analog of what we're talking about, right? And what we were talking about back here was... Um, well... Oh gosh, we've got many things going on. I mean, we're, we're trying to understand how best to represent a, an unresolved state of multiple distributed computing elements um, Right. And the interesting point was being made by Hans on our live stream about distributed consensus and things like IOTA. Um, and that that's, that's an attempt to not do what one has traditionally done of distributed computing, of just sort of waiting for, for one to get to a definitive state. Yeah. And I, I guess the analog would be, yeah, like for a database, you know, we're so used to thinking of databases, there's like some global truth about everything that every client needs full access to. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the kind of relaxation is that, well, actually, for most things you don't care about, like the whole sets of degrees of freedom that just aren't relevant to what you're trying to do. Right. The only thing that matters is the causal graph that leads to what you care about. Right. Yes, exactly. So, and, and so I think what we need to understand, I'm just trying to think. Um, it's kind of like Git, by the way. It's very similar to Git because with Git, you can do your commits, and um, you try to, you know, commit to whatever master um, on some other server, and you find that it's things have happened in the meantime. But as long as your commits can commute through all the other commits, then you just do a rebase, and everyone's happy. Okay, let's talk about that. For so a somewhat, so somewhat, somewhat trivial point. No, but but you're saying that. What is the analog of the causal graph in Git? So I think it's line-based. So what complicates things a little bit is that um, there are all these like complex um, diff resolution algorithms that can do like pretty non-trivial things to figure out how two uh, diffs need to be unified, right? Mm -hmm. And so like that makes the picture a little bit more messy 
But if you imagine that you were just like changing one line at a time, then you know causal edges represent that um, you made a modification that required another modification to have happened for yours to make any sense. In other words, you changed one line of a function that someone else committed. Right. So, so it's exactly convinced. yeah. Right. It's the same yeah. thing as the elements in the hypergraph. If if you use the same element in the hypergraph, then that element, you know, if if a particular event uses an element in the hypergraph, then then that event has to have happened before the event that is that where you're going to use that output element can happen. Same edge. Mm. Yes. But but so. What is the actual terminology in Git that is the causal graph? Oh my, I don't think people work with that often. Um, I don't think How it does it one. relate to email threading? Is it that the same thing again? Mm, I wouldn't say so because there's no commutation. Like you never like taking your reply and commuting it through other people's replies. <laughs> Although I sometimes wanted to. But there's still you can't reply to something that hasn't yet been received by you. So in other words, if you've got a conversation going on with multiple people and they are putting in, you know, replies and, and adding things, isn't it the case that isn't, don't you have a similar situation? No, I think there's no unification ever. That's one of the things that's super annoying about email. As soon as it diverges, as soon as a thread splits in two, there's no way to bring those two threads back together because email chains are just chains. They don't ever have two parents, right? So and that's what not true like? in Git. That I mean, there totally should be a merge for email. <laughs> yeah, there should be. Yeah. What would it do? So, it would, so it would you know, if if two people, you know, two people reply to the same email at the same time, so that so, you know, their their, their two uh, replies ended up on two different branches of the multiway system. There should be a way of re rethreading them. So that which you know whichever one was earliest comes before it in the chain, so to speak. Oh, I see. So I see. So yeah. so you put it into a single piece of email where exactly. where you have both replies. Right. I see. So so the the email analog. All right. So the claim is, um, you know, that um, about Git. There is something called the the Git commit graph, uh, which I don't know that much about, but I think it doesn't it does relate to the causality of of commits. Um, yeah. So, so the thing about the Git that I've that I've realized is that um, so a crucial thing in Git, like there are two kinds of major ways that people work with Git, right? One is um, that you work on separate branches, and at some point you make an attempt to unify those branches. Right. And you do that with a special kind of commit called a merge commit. And what a merge commit is, is a way of saying, I, a human being, have looked at branch A and branch B, and here's what I think it means to combine them. That's all it means. You could actually replace everything with emojis, and that would be a valid merge commit. Mm -hmm. And I think what's cool is that there's a, that feels a little bit uh, new spendix y, right? Because it's like you just added in a, um, a unification manually that did what you wanted. And it's not in any sense natural. I see. Right. Kenneth Benick's completion is a way is one way of resolving merge conflicts. I see. Okay. Well, so hold on. So merge conflicts. Okay. Well, this is a merge conflict think, resolution thing, isn't it? I don't think that's quite right. So I think my yeah. claim would be that any merge is non-trivial. Like, well, that's not quite true, but like almost all merges that touch the same file. Like a computer had to do some sophisticated heuristics that can sometimes be wrong, right? Oh, wait a minute. And if so it, if any got... such... Yeah. Well, that, that's the question. Actually, it's what Max likes to call accidental isomorphism. That's what will cause it to be wrong. Because you've got lines of code in there, right? And if your lines of code were, had unique IDs, if every line of code was a unique ID, there would be no... If every line of code was a UUID, there would be no issue about merging. Merging will be quite straightforward. You just look at the lines of code in the file and you see, you know, is there any conflict between the UUIDs? This is this is where what goes where. But if on the other hand it's actual code and that, you know, that you know, function, whatever it was, occurs, you know, in both 
in both branches of the file, there can be an accidental isomorphism, so to speak, between those files. Yes, and so what will happen in that case is that um, Git, when you do Git merge, blah, 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 Git will say, oh, merge, merge successful, right? And then you just commit that. And now you've, to you've told the universe that these two branches are now one branch, right? Right. Um, but it, it, that's bad. <laughs> that's, you know, oh, I understand that. About that. That's, so accidental isomorphism is, um, is the analog of a questionable Git merge. I think yeah. Max, you you must understand this. Right. Well, in a sense, I'm not sure if I quite get this. Is this, is this isomorphism thing a good thing, Max, or is it like does that represent a bug? Well, I mean, I don't know if you would call it a bug. I mean, in in Wolfram model, we don't do that at all. Don't do what? Uh, isomorphism. Right, we're doing it in the multi-way system, but not... The multi-way system is saying merging of branches in the multi-way system is a result of saying these two hypergraphs are isomorphic. See what I'm saying, Tally? Two branches yes. in the multi-way system merge if the, if the hypergraphs are isomorphic. Now, you could have a different strategy where every hypergraph has its complete history embedded in it, in which case there will be no such accidental isomorphisms. Yeah, but the problem is not doing them is that, so if you're looking at causally invariant systems, so one way something can be causally invariant is there is never ever, never any overlap. So in that case, we don't need to do isomorphism and it will still be Cause invariant. Right, right, right. But it's a yeah. more complicated case of causal invariance where we need multiple steps to merge. Then, if you don't have any isomorphism testing, they wouldn't merge and it wouldn't be cause invariant anymore. Okay, but so what's the Git analog of this? So, I mean, the Git analog is. Um, well, we have two branches which have different histories, but they arrive to the same file. The file with the same content. Right. Right. So, okay. And that, does Git actually merge it automatically? I thought it would say it's a, it's a conflict in that case. I don't think so. I think it looks at the actual, I, I think it's data dependent. I think it looks at the actual data. At least that's it what the old patching systems one do. One by one, and it would, it it wouldn't be able to apply history from well I don't know well I I don't know what it does but I mean the very old I don't know RCS and all the patching systems and so on used to do they used to look at the data they didn't just look at the history they looked at the data to see whether you could merge things I don't know I mean whether you know so the question here is is merging based only on history um. No, there's there's a thing. There's a sorry. Three. I I kind of phased off a bit. So you might have said this, but there's a thing called a three-way merge. That is not just like, oh, how do I combine about these changes? But like, I know what the parent is, and I can almost compute a vector difference for the one thing and a vector difference for the other, and try to add those two vectors together, kind of thing. So. Um, so that's called a three three-way merge. If if you're interested. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you know enough git? So there is a. So here's a question. If we have one line and two branches change this line, and we have two branches, both of which change this line to exactly the same other line. And then we so I think Git will be Git, Git will be happy with that. Git will be quite happy with that. If so we want to build a model, sorry, go ahead. No, uh, um, Pauletti on our live stream is saying Git is, uses Merkle trees. To... It does, yeah. Maintain immutability, but so, doesn't. But if it's using Merkle trees, that means it's it's maintaining. I mean, that's a that's a pure history, not data dependent thing, isn't that correct? No, that's data. I mean, like oh, I see, I see. Hashing. It's hashing. I, I understand. Yeah. It's hashing into the Merkle trees, so it is data dependent. Okay, fine, I get it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, you were going to say no. something else, Tally. I can't remember if it was useful or not. Um, okay, but anyway, but I, I want to make a, a note about the fact that email does not have a merge capability, which means 
i.e., if two people uh, reply to the same message, right, you get two different chains. Hmm. As opposed to one message with two replies. And that means that you can't have that that the that the causal graph of email must always be a tree. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. As opposed to um Uh, by the way, there is a thing called operational transform. Do you remember there was this product called Google Wave way back in the day? Yes, I which do. Which was like that. meant to be sort of generalization of news groups, email, everything all together, chat all together. Yes. And it, it didn't didn't last, but um, it did take this whole thing of like, you know, how do you juggle like hundreds of potentially conflicting commits in a way that like everyone sees something that's at least reasonably consistent and. And so the whole theory of that is called operational transform. I don't know why it has that name. I don't know if it's particularly deep, but I do know that it was a, a nightmare to implement and everyone was very unhappy <laughs> with, with how difficult it was to get right. Well, uh, so, so what is that doing? That, that, that's trying to do, I mean, that's like what with, is being said that these distributed consensus algorithms are doing. You're saying that, that you can have many conversations going on or that everybody sees a consistent causal history of their conversation, even if they do not see, even if outside of their view, other conversations may not be consistent. Is that what you're saying? I, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm claiming it's that smart. If you, if you just Google it, you will see a picture that's quite evocative, that looks very much like some of the, uh, you know, it's like a space-time diagram kind of thing. But okay. it's like how to edits commit to each other. And... Operational transforms? Yeah, well, just there's no S. Or transformation, I guess, is the full. Gosh, what is all this? People just reinvent wow, the that's... same thing endlessly. Don't they? <laughs> I know. It's, it's... <laughs> what the heck is this? Mm. Yet another thing I don't know about. The world is full of things I don't know about. What is this? Wow. So this is this is another model for distributed computing, or what? What the heck is this? No, I wouldn't say so. this is... distributed distributed editing. I think is what. Oh look, what? Well, that's interesting. Like no, there's like mathy stuff going on here. That's cool. Oh, causality preservation. Interesting. Is that what it was saying here? The. No, yeah. Well, at some point, I will understand this, but. No, this is, I mean, but, 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 so what's the point? So computer supported cooperative work. So how does this relate to systems that allow, I mean, is this related to collaborative editing systems or is this not? I mean, those. Yeah, that's the use case. It's like Google Docs. Is okay, precisely fine. The use case. All right, fine. So this is, this is the formalism of that. Is that the idea? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the idea, yeah. So what, what always occurs to me about, about source code though is that we're working with so much something much nicer, which is that like in theory, we're really making edits to the abstract syntax tree. We're not just editing a giant array of characters, right? right indeed, right. And, and so like like if things were actually good in the world and they're not, everything's bad, <laughs> then Git would be resolving mergers and this kind of thing by Looking at the syntax know, tree. Fig yes, exactly. Yeah. And then so many endless little niggles about like new lines and whatever would just not be relevant. Well, the trouble is synthesizing what you actually want the code to look like when you, I mean, in the end, the way it's shown to humans is as a piece of code as character strings. What the abstract mm -hmm. syntax tree looks like, there are many different, you know, that's the pretty printing problem. You know, that's the True. code formatting problem, which which is also hard to solve. I mean, given two pieces of code that are formatted differently and you do a merge on them and it can do something incredibly clever knitting them together, what happens if the two authors had different new line conventions? Yeah, 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 exactly. And, but see, what's fun about that is that like, if you just saw 
the kind of surface syntax decoration as being little attributes that were set on the AST and remembered, then you could have amazing kind of feats of merging in which someone like literally reformatted the entire file, you know, changing from one convention yeah, right. to another. The <laughs> second person did an edit and they magically commute to each other. Well, so, so what this is, let me remind you that in our graph theory system, you know, we have this notion of a calculus of annotations. That is, given that you turn a, the node of a graph red, does that survive taking the graph union or not? Yeah, that's, that's fun, yeah. Unfortunately, that calculus of annotations is highly non-trivial, and it's completely unclear. You know, there's some cases that are pretty obvious, and there's some cases it's very, very unclear what you want to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't even know, and I don't know how that's related to this question of, um, I mean... It's very much, it's very much like, a, like a connection in differential geometry, because it's like you can imagine the annotations as living in some little tangent space on each vertex. And you know all your operations. You, just, you want to make sure that you know how to carry that tangent space through to the new thing. Yeah, that's an interesting analogy. But so, what do you conclude from that? I mean, I don't know. nothing. <laughs> it. I mean. So what? I mean, so so, you're saying. Okay. Well, well, I mean, there's there's a fun thing which would be like maybe there's some way of of deeply generalizing and. God's sake, probably some category theorists already did this for 30 years ago, you know, but like deeply generalizing the notion of a connection to be about very abstract bundles. Um, and, it, and, and maybe actually discrete, like what is the discrete analog of differential geometry? It seems like relevant to the physics project, right? Like how yeah, do you, sure. what is well, generalized yeah, Stokes we, we do understand like that. Yes, we, we do think we understand that because basically what happens is the tangent space is the set of, is the equivalent class of geodesics going through a particular point. Right, so okay. the geodesics what? are all, uh, you know, complicated, you know, they have all this complicated discrete directions and discrete paths through the hypergraph. But the tangent space is, you know, the tangent vector, well, the, the, yes, the ta tangent space is the equivalence class of all those geodesics that go through a given point. Where does linearity come from in that picture? Linearity of what? Oh, of the tangent. I mean, it's a vector space, so you you know that possesses linearity. Is that just like weights on the the the? I think it's JD six. Yeah, I think so. I think it's just the fact that you just go down. Um, I think it's just a trivial fact about the JD six going from one point to another. I think it's almost by definition of the GD6 because unlike in a continuous space where you have to worry about, you know, where there's no easy counting of GD6, here it's trivial to count GD6. Hmm. But, but I mean, okay, we're getting off track here, but but I think, I mean... Um, where, where, does the metri where does the metric come from in that picture? So you got, I got two bundles of GD6. How do I decide whether they're orthogonal or not? Uh, I mean, the one one claim is they're orthogonal. I mean, orthogonality means as you project. I mean, one claim is you can assume they're orthogonal if they are just different GD6 coming out of that. But we're, we're getting off track. Off track. The, uh, if, okay, if, you find, <laughs> if the GD6 endpoints are G1 and G2, and you do the fine shortest graph path from G2 to any point on the first GD6, if it ends up being the origin point, then they're orthogonal. Okay. Yeah, You'll have to write that down for me. No, no, but actually that's an obvious definition. That's saying there's no point. that If the GD6 goes in two directions, right? You have two GD6 going from a single point. If mm -hmm. the, those endpoints of those two GD6 are such that if, if the two ends of the GD6 are closer to each other than they are to the origin point, then it is not orthogonal. Then those two GD6 okay. are orthogonal. If the two GD6 are... If the endpoint is um, uh, closer to the origin than to either than to the other endpoint, then they can be considered orthogonal. I mean, there must be some way of you've got to turn that into a positive definite or whatever quadratic form. So you'd have to prove that that is there has to be like a formula, right? But uh, I get the idea. Yeah, right. Okay, let's come back for a minute to to I mean, so. Okay. 
Yeah, go ahead. Can, can I make a couple of comments on what you were discussing earlier? Yes. Uh, so I, I don't think it is the case that the causal graph for email is a tree. I think it's the case that the evolution graph is a tree. And the causal, the multi-way causal graph is also a tree if you take its transitive reduction. The causal graph in the space-time case for email is a path, or its transitive reduction is a path. Um, the other thing was that in the GitHub case, when we when you were discussing edits, it it is not the case, I believe, that the thing that Max claimed that um, you have causal invariance as long as you have non-overlapping of stuff, because you can still have update events. You, you know, you can still have events that effectively aren't. They, they apply to two causally disconnected parts of the document, so to speak. Particularly if the document is expanding faster than light in your, you know, in your multi-way model of the GitHub repository. What? What? But, okay, hold on. <laughs> so, okay. so if you, if you that, that's a great, that's it, a great, it, that's a great pull quote. Yes. Okay. All right. Jonathan, re, re, retry that. Which, which part? The... The, the, email the, or the, GitHub the, the, doc, the documents expanding faster than light. Right. Okay. Well, of course, if you okay, if, if Max, if you do as Max says, and every you know every line is an updating event, then it doesn't. Then that's okay. But that, that's effectively saying you have to you know you have to commit after every single line you change. If instead a commit is a is a commit, then it can change an arbitrary number of lines. And in particular, if you're if you are growing the document in such a way you know in such a way that um, if you have two people and, and, they're, and they're both making commits that are growing the document very quickly at different places, then it can still be the case that the multi-way evolution graph doesn't converge, even if their commits don't overlap. And this is a consequence of the fact that branch-like separation in the multi-way evolution graph is a, oh, so, sorry, space-like separation in the multi-way evolution graph is a special case of branch-like separation, which is why we make a distinction between generational and non-generational multi-way systems. Okay, let me try to unpack that. So your basic claim is that each separate commit is each commit is an event. You know, okay, we, we've seen we've seen this in in strings, right? So if you can, a string is a is a minimal example of a source file. So you can think of each character as being a line that's being modified. Yes. Right. So we've seen this example where you can have non-overlapping string rules that grow the string superluminally in such a way that you get causal disconnection. Yes. Right, even though there is no overlap in the actual updating rules. So this is the what case- is, What is get... causal disconnection in the case of Git? Well, that is, so, I mean, causal disconnection in the multi-way causal graph, which is what I was discussing, is, you know, is one situation in which you'd get branch pairs that don't resolve. The fact that they don't resolve is not a reflection of the fact that there is overlap. It's a reflection of the fact that you have superluminal expansion. It's a different way that you can break causal invariance. Yeah, it's by having a black hole, basically. You have an event or, horizon. Or a cosmic event well, horizon. Well, right. we could have two Git branches which don't touch the same code, but they which are separate because nobody has ever made a merge commit. Right, so, yeah. right. But that was, the, that was the point I was making at the beginning about these merge conflicts. Right? So you technically have a merge conflict even when there isn't, you know, even when the people edited different parts of the document, there is still a merge conflict. It just happens to be a merge, it's conflict. Not a merge yeah. conflict. I think the difference between merge conflicts and ordinary merges is a difference between branch-like separation and space-like separation. I know, I know. But my point is space-like separation is a special case of branch-like separation. It happens to correspond to the case where it's a, it's a, it's a merge conflict that can be reconciled automatically. The, the case of a merge conflict that cannot be reconciled automatically is the case of a pure branch-like separation, which, is, which would be a branch-like separation in the generational multi-way system as opposed to the multi-way system. Unpack so that it'd be fun. Well, that, that's essentially our disagreement between global and local multi-way system. Is that you right. treat space-like separation as special given branch-like separation? Right, to be precisely to deal with the case where you have causal invariance that breaks even though you don't have branch-like separate. You know, there's no branch, there's no pure branch-like separation in the superluminal expansion case, but you still get non-resolving branch pairs. And, yeah, to, yeah. and that's yeah. only a phenomenon that you can see in the global multiway system. What's weird about that example is that no one's adding new lines to a file with the speed of light. So that, that confused me. But I see your point, right? That, yeah. I'm, yeah. I don't see the point. So the, wait a minute. But so you're saying you, there's you, a cosmic event horizon. But what does it mean when there are two separated 
causal graphs. You're just saying people can modify a file completely independently if they are sufficiently far apart in the file, or what? What are you saying? Yeah, right. Yeah, as 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 long as they're not in conflict in, in in their line numbers. So as long as they're space like separated, you know, if, if if you have two programmers and they're both, you know, every time they see a for loop, they replace it with three for loops or something, uh, and they're just repeatedly making commits of this kind, then that's those are those are super those are locally kind of superluminal expansions that will not. Okay, converge. Hold on, John. I don't understand why they're saying they don't converge because if we have events in specially separate parts in the graph, then we can just apply them in different orders and get to the same output. Uh, not that just the resolution of the pair. Uh, not not if they are in is a not not if the right hand side of the rule is uh is causing the state to expand faster than light Why? it feels like it's lost a connection with text now like i don't i don't see how files are expanding like at the speed of light what does that mean it it means that so you know if if you have as like i say if you have some idealized version of programmers where they you know that the the programmer is following some rule that says every time i see a for loop i replace it with whatever um then hmm. that that rule that the programmer is following defines an effective speed of light because that you know they they can only edit sort of one for loop at a time or something why because that if that if that is their rule that they, they they say every time i see a for loop i replace it with some you know some other stuff and then i make i make that commit then each commit is by definition you know the, the 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 rate of information propagation is is no greater than one for loop at a time. Okay, John, okay. can you give an example of where the pairs don't merge? Uh, I'm sure we have examples in the strings case, don't we? We we have we found causally disconnected things without overlaps. Let me see if I can. Yes, I think there's some in my paper. Um. Uh, look, we, we should refocus and then we should probably wrap up in a minute here. Um, mm. I mean, ag again, what, what we're trying to get back to is we have a very minimal model here of, of, you know, this was a trivial example of distributed computing. We want to have a good, see, uh, again, the thing that's, the thing I'm trying to understand is how do you communicate between these, you know, to what we want, presumably. The most general case is data dependent communication between processors. Sure, yeah, yeah. Where the choice of which processor you, I mean, because one of the things that can happen is, you know, it's all well and good to say, oh, I'm going to run a fast Fourier transform and I'm going to have, you know, I, I want my, you know, whatever it is, butterflied, um, you know, processor yeah. to be communicating with me. But that's an address for a processor. The most interesting case, which is the case that comes up in the physics project, probably the case that comes up in distributed consensus, is there is no, well, actually, I'm not sure about distributed consensus. In the physics case, you know, the communicating processors, aka places where events happen, do not have addresses in any way. They are merely connected by virtue of edges of the hypergraph. Yes, yeah, so, so that's exactly yeah, that's exactly I think the right picture, and that's why in this toy example, that first master node, you know, we didn't posit that three nodes just like newly bought each other magically. It's that you know, if if processes are able to communicate, it's because some other process set them up to know about exactly, each other. Exactly. Yes. Right. And they only knew, knew knew about each other locally through that causal connection. I think that's. You could invent a name for that, like locality or something, but it's. I think that's super important because it's like it's no, the so right your, way your to think about is, these. And your of. point is that's also the way that Go is doing it. That is that what is happening is you create a process, but the connection to that process is by virtue of the fact that you created it. There's yes. no absolute space. It is. Yes. There's no absolute address for that process. It, it's purely exactly. okay. But then, then when exactly, I, and then, and then. And then the dictionary would be that edges are the um, are the the sites of of kind of uh, message passing, 
and yes. vertices are the sites of state, and that's it. Like you can do with that model, you can do a lot of different things, including reading and writing to memory. You can model like how Rust deals with with concurrency by having um, only readers, or if there's one writer, then there can't be any other readers. Like there's a lot of things that fit into that picture. Okay, so you're saying okay, so this this part of our dictionary is, um, which I agree with, is edges and causal graph are. Well, it's message Hypergraph. passing. But it just, no, it's not the yeah, it's yeah. not the causal graph. It, it's it's that's it's a little bit more complicated because the edges in the it's not the edges in the hypergraph. The edges in the hypergraph represent the current frozen state. It is a representation. You see what I'm saying? I think that I think it's more like this, and the state it's a little more complicated. Mm -hmm. No, because think about it like this. Like, let's say I wrote something to a register, and then 10 years later, I read something from that register. Mm -hmm. I would get a causal edge that connects me back to that initial state of mind. Yes. That's, got not, that's not message passing. Like, that's genuine. <laughs> that's genuine, like, you know, dependence. I see. So you're saying the, your, your claim is that edges in the hypergraph are. Oh, I see. I see. I see your point. There's a token that is being passed, right? So, a message, message passing is, um, you know, you pass a token to your descendant, so to speak, to your mm -hmm. uh, communicatee. Mm -hmm. Okay, that token is an element in the hypergraph. Is one of the points in the hypergraph. So in other words, you're saying that's an X. You know, this thing that I'm calling X is being passed to that communicate. That that's the thing that that is that act of passing that token, which creates an edge in the hypergraph. Does this make sense? I mean, so in other words, what I'm saying is, you have a state. You know, mm -hmm. and the thing that is causing you. To have any communication is the fact that the X that you have is the same as the X that's in, the the X in your the X in one hyper edge is the same X as in as as in, as is in another hyper edge. Yes, I agree. Yes, yes, yes. So yes, so the communication medium there can be represented by a shared vertex, right? Right. And so, if you don't insist on the pure on the very pure version of hypergraphs where there's no colors then you can just say the content of the message is the color of that X, right? Fair enough. But I mean, we're saying here, the X in one hypergraph is the same X as in, a, as in another hyper edge. And that, so then in fact, what we're saying here is that it's shared, it's the sharing of elements between hyper edges that, co that corresponds to the passing of tokens yeah, exactly. And that sharing of elements between hyper edges is what the heck is that? That's kind of the dual. No. Why is that? Okay, hold on. I'm I'm not quite well, understanding well, this. Well, let, let's imagine two. Let's imagine two processes, right? So let's represent them with a the vertex. E, well, mm -hmm. Each one is a vertex, right? They got to be able to communicate with each other. But there's, it's not like and it's not um, that the one uh, processor can just overwrite the state of the other processor. It's a sort of like equal partners type of communication, right? So vertex one has to give a message that is then read by vertex two. And as you're saying, that can be accomplished with a third vertex that's in between them. That's the token. I see. I see. So, so the you're space saying, is so merely the topology of that, yeah. So you're saying it's X, Y, Y, Z, and the message, which which is corresponds to, you know, in that graph, right? That 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 defines the communication between X and Z. Yeah. So you could be more straightforward about it and say that X just magically changes the state of Z, but that's kind of a little bit more rude. 
and invasive. Right. Right, but that, this defines communication between X and Z. So if X and Z are sort of persistent elements, this is establishing the fact that this piece of hypergraph exists essentially allows events that knit together X and Z. C can yes, I interject yeah. something? Yeah. Uh, message passing is just branchial causal edges, branch like causal edges. Okay. Because the existence of a shared element implies the existence of a branch pair because there's now an overlap in your updating rules. So the, the, the register, so the case that you suggested of like, you know, you, you write to some memory location uh, 10 years ago and then you use that same memory location in 10 years' time, that's causal relations, but on a single multi way evolution branch, right? Because you're, you're just updating the same thing in its own future. But in the case where you have shared elements and, and which therefore different processes are able to communicate through a method like this, those are causal ledges that exist between different multi-way evolution branches. So the distinction between the two yes. is whether they're, whether they're space-time or branch-like uh, causal ledges. Yes, and that, and that branching also corresponds to whether the recipient received the message or not, right? Like if they, that's one source of ambiguity in this picture is whether that message went through. And if you right. choose not to apply the rule that allows Y to affect Z, then you're just saying, okay, in this picture, you know, the message just got blocked or whatever, dropped on the floor. Um, well, what, what you're saying is when there is a thing like this, when there is an overlap, it implies the presence of a branch pair, which is. Yes. And yeah, then, I think that's right. and, and, and then yeah. whether the elements of those branch pair, the, those two branch pairs are in causal contact is precisely the question of whether, whether they successfully passed a message from one branch to the other. So this also lets us get at yeah memory. So you can see why is a kind of memory location as well, which is nice. Because then it's the yeah. same whole story as before with different processes, but now it's different threads and they, you know, communicating via memory, which is again, a fraught. But there's one thing in common, which is because we're not considering Byzantine situations where anyone can fail in like arbitrary ways. We still have to say that um, the way that individual processes evolve is deterministic. Like we're not going to allow any multi-way ambiguity there because no one is interested in that in distributed computation. Computers are reliable within yeah. the CPU, you know. Right, that's correct. Right, that was a that's a different set of problems. I mean, th this is this is solving the problem. No packets are dropped. The um, you know, things are so. So we're saying why here. Um, could be a shared memory look. It could be a message being passed or a shared memory location. But, but I mean, I think okay. So the question, what we're trying to get at here, is assume we. Okay, so th this allows us to essentially compile a program. We we could imagine essentially compiling a program. Um, to, you know, we have some some simple functional language. We compile a program, and then we compile a distributed program. We then generate its multi-way causal graph, hmm. which is then some very complicated, messy thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. My claim has been, as we think about that programming we will want to think about it in terms of a particular reference frame. So in other words, mm -hmm. is my vision of, of what might happen. That is, given this program, the program uniquely implies a certain multi-way graph, which will be very hard to reason about. But it could be that there is a particular well, I mean, I, I don't know if this is correct, but I mean, you know, there's a particular foliation of the multi-way graph that makes a reasonable understanding of what's going on in the program. Now, I mean, the problem would be, but there are all these other foliations and they correspond to different resolutions of these race conditions, basically. Hmm. What would be super interesting is, so I, I agree with you and I think, I think there's like scope for this to be as much about theoretical progress in any of these things as it is about just like better tools for thinking about this stuff, right? 
Mm -hmm. And maybe even those tools are literally software tools. So you can imagine like trying to deal with foliations of, you know, your program exactly. and you want to do them relative to a particular debugging state. Like you paused your program and you want to be like, what histories are consistent with what I see now? Actually, that's and very interesting. Foliation. Because that's that mm -hmm. pausing the debugging Pausing a particular part of the distributed system is exactly like freezing the foliations in the way that we're thinking about doing quantum measurement. Hmm. So in other words, you're freezing around some particular state in the multiway system. You say, I want to recognize this particular thing happening. Okay, so then what happens is, the other, I think I even had a picture someplace here, right? You've frozen this particular state. And then there are only the certain, it, once you've frozen a, that state. Is it the ABA, ABA state, state that you've frozen? Which, right, because, okay. because what's happening underneath the ABA state is time is progressing, chunk, 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 but the ABA state does not evolve. Right? That's what this picture of foliations means. Right? Over, over here, right, it's as time goes click, 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 we're evolving through these states, ABB, ABBB, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But here, time is frozen. But maintaining the partial order means you freeze time for that particular state. In, in other words, what it's saying is, let's say you have a value of a variable, x equals seven, at some processor in your distributed computing thing. You have frozen and you are looking at x equals seven, right? But other things in your distributed system could be evolving along with x staying equal to 7. But there's some things in your system that couldn't evolve if you freeze x to be 7. That yeah, they're trapped. Where they're, they're, they're pinned by that relationship. Exactly, which is exactly what's happening here. And exactly the kind mm -hmm. of model for, for quantum measurement is, and, and there's progressive decoherence, so to speak. That is, by pinning that fact, you can say less and less about there's there's more and more of your distributed computing system that is not doing what it normally does. If you can see clarify. Yeah, what I'm saying is yeah. what's that? But by but once you pin no, that x equals seven, right? Then there's essentially this light cone of stuff that starts or an entanglement cone that develops below the x equals seven thing. That is the things that were affected by your pinning of x being equal to seven. Right, the rest of the system can evolve, but you have prevented you have pre prevented an increasing number of degrees of freedom in your distributed computing system cannot do what they would normally do, because you pin. Oh, so they're frozen two. by your by your. Okay, I see. Right. So that so I guess the, the general the, yeah. That they're frozen by your choice of foliation. In other words, because you chose that debugging state. Other parts of the of your distributed computing universe can't evolve. So, in other words, if you are asking a question like, "Could this, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, email message get delivered somewhere?" Well, you can't tell because you your state got frozen because you were debugging and you said X has got to be equal to seven, and so that part of the mm. the distributed computing system that was delivering an email message or something may have been consequently frozen, so to speak. Hmm. I mean, I think that's yeah. a very interesting calculus of the stuff that needs to be worked out a bit, right? Like, because if you imagine building a tool of this kind, then you're going to be want to be like, you know, warping these various um, foliations yeah, exactly. to investigate exactly. a practical a practical bug. Like, you don't care about what they look like in the abstract. You want to solve some problem. Well, quite. But I mean, I, I think my point is that that you know one of the things that we're finding in the physics project is the calculus of foliations is not well worked out. Mm. That is, in general relativity, you know, we have inertial frames. Okay, we understand those. We have accelerating frames. We kind of understand those. Um, you know, after that, we're not, you know, there isn't, there aren't a lot of well-known choices of foliations. So it feels like, you know, you could imagine in the case of distributed computing debugging, I mean, again, it would be interesting to know for these distributed consensus algorithms, what is the notion? Are there well understood um, uh, examples of foliations, so to speak? In other mm -hmm. words, 
And uh, yes, I think. Well, I, 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 did, I, did, I did want to inject. I did want to inject one one idea into that, which is I think picking a particular observer, which I suppose for for the distributed computer case, that's like one processor, right? That's what space is. Is like the processor. Yes. Yep. Um, uh, is like you know relativizing things with respect to the, uh, an observer is the right way to like try to develop that calculus in my view like that's my intuition is telling me that yeah and then saying like could these two observers disagree about anything irrespective of the global state like that's another kind of question you could imagine on um kind of answering well um, also, and maybe it's the same yeah. as just yeah there's also curvature kinds of questions. That is, you know, given that you have these two things happening from these points in space, you know, you do a, one of these parallel transport rectangles type thing. You can imagine doing the same thing in the distributed computing case. That is, how much disagreement can there be if you go on these two different paths? Hmm. No, it's super interesting to think about. What would be useful, like if we can port things back from, you know, um, Riemannian geometry back into computing. Like, what could we possibly imagine might be useful there? Like, I want to, but I also want to be. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, so I'll give you an example continuity, for instance. So, in the following sense, that I still think there is a calculus of foliations in the sense that there will be a, you know, there's a parameterization of useful foliations, just like there are, you know, continuous functions or something, or a useful mm -hmm. set of functions to consider, linear functions, whatever. Okay. Right. Um, so the question is, what are the useful foliations to consider? You could consider foliations that are unbelievably wild, but are completely human incomprehensible. So, for example, the extreme case of foliations is, um, you know, this is this argument I was making recently about the correspondence between thermodynamics, general relativity, quantum mechanics, and so on, where, you know, by choosing, it's like the Maxwell's demon trying to very carefully sculpt this sequence of molecules that go on one side of the box versus the other. And that's mm. analogous to trying to very elaborately sculpt. Well, my, my analogy, which I still need to develop a little bit, is the, is the civilization that lives around a star that is about to turn into a black hole. And they're desperately trying to move little pieces of mass around to prevent the inevitable singularity theorem, so to speak, from from uh, happening, just like the Maxwell's demon is desperately trying to move molecules around to prevent the gas going to its equilibrium state. And um, mm. I think these are two examples of incredibly elaborate foliations that are being set up that are pretty unrealistic for, you know, they, they are requiring so much computation that you're essentially reverse engineering the behavior of the system. So in other yeah, words, yeah, exactly. like, yeah, like, yeah. like saying the foliation is, you know, the computing is in the foliation, which is not what you want. What you want is what are the natural set of, of um, kind of, you know, there's a language basically of foliations that one needs to have. What is the set of foliations that are describable and that are reasonable about, you know, reasonable and reasoning, you know, about which one can reason, so to speak. Um, well, well, what I what I, I like about the the Rulial, Rulial space concept is that you know then in some sense like curvature in, in that space is telling you you know from the point of view of some you know uh, some foliation some computable foliation how wacky do other um, do other evolutions look like evolutions that would be natural in another foliation right yes that's and I guess that's this that it's 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 kind of what you're saying about the oh Maxwell's demon is like a you know like you have to pick, isn't there a famous theorem about the, the act of erasing the bits in computing Maxwell's demon produces no, more entropy than you? Wrong. That turns out to be irrelevant right. and wrong. I mean, it, it's sort right. of right, but it's sort of wrong. I mean, that, that, was a, that was when people believed that computing cost energy, when they believed that every gate erased data. Okay. I mean, I think that the- the, the, the idea of why the Maxwell's demon can't work is much more a computational irreducibility idea than it is an idea of, oh, the demon would have to store that much data or erase, you know, because the idea was that the demon is ha having to do a lot of computing. Okay, fine. That's the real problem. The demon is doing a lot of computing. The notion that the demon is using heat to do computing is just wrong because it isn't true. I mean, you can... Uh, you know, and I, I don't think the number of operations, I mean, the practical problem is 
the demon has to basically be, you know, be capable of decrypting everything that happened in the gas. And, you know, yeah. that requires a computation that is just equivalent to the computation going on in the gas. And once you have that, you can make it work. You don't have to have any other, you know, there's no other, there's no heat dissipation or anything there. It's just, well, it's just doing computation equivalent to the decryption of what happened in the gas, I think. Um, okay. Causal edge density or causal edge flux density is proportional to event density. Just. Well, okay. In the, in the model of physics, right. In the end, that's saying that there is a, well, what is the interpretation of that? Because that's that there is not a the difference. Between computational power and, and, and energy. That there is, a, there is a minimal energy that gets expended in doing any piece of computation. Yeah, but that's, it's not expended, remember, because it, that, that, those are causal edges that there's a flux of causal edges that might correspond to energy, but that's total energy. That's not energy expenditure. That's not being dissipated as heat. Just saying, well, he in question. order to so do computation, about, yeah. Well, it, if, it's, if it's just about entropy in the end, then couldn't you make an argument that like, okay, so you don't want to do any work, so you're going to have reversible gates, right? Mm -hmm. As soon as you have reversible gates, you have to have enough ancillary bits to absorb all the kind of waste junk sure. from your computation. Those ancillary bits represent the entropy that you remove from the system. So you just like include the computer and it's increased in entropy because those ancillary bits went from all zeros to something really nasty. Here's and the that's problem. the only way. Yeah. yeah. Here's the problem. But isn't that, it, it, what, what's wrong with that? Argument? Okay. The, the, what's wrong with that argument is the muddle about what entropy is. Because if you've got a particular gas for the particular Maxwell demon doing particular things, where's the entropy? Entropy is a statement about ensembles. Sure. So the only way you get a quotes, the, the way you get an entropy out of that is by coarse graining the single instance. And then you're totally exactly. confused about what's going on. And the, you know, the, the real story, I think, again, is about this question of, of you know, the computational effort that has to go on in the demon to reverse what the gas is doing. And, you know, at a sort of level of the microcanonical ensemble or the individual states, I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. It just, it, it's just like you're, you're, you know, you, you could have a miniature version of the, the gas inside the demon and they do it, you know, it, it's decrypting things and so on. I, I don't think there's anything fundamentally goes wrong. It's, I mean, I think it, it actually works and people even try and build these things. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's just that, that, as soon as you do coarse graining, as soon as you make the coarse graining realistic, you are denying the possibility that any sophisticated computation can go on because the coarse graining is, is said to be not realistic if it involves sophisticated computation. Anyway, but, but I mean, I just want to loop back to the, the question of what, you know, look, I agree the objective here. Okay, here's, here's my sort of, cognitive map of what I think one is trying to do, okay? On the one hand, one is trying to make a practical, okay, so first point, the first meta point, insofar as we're making progress with the fundamental theory of physics, the number one reason for that is because we have a certain amount of intuition about how computational systems work, which we've been able to apply to things about physics, which weren't obvious before, like the way that time works and things like this, which comes and you know the fact that you can get complicated behavior from simple rules, blah, blah, blah. This is all kind of computational intuition stuff. So, and, and that comes in, in no small part from doing, you know, from having done lots of practical computing. This whole business about frames and this whole sort of uh, uh, flexibility of representation thing is something about which we have little intuition from practical computing. So my claim is, were we to get a language for describing that in practical computing, we would be able to immediately, you know, we would get intuition about that, which we could immediately port into the physics case. Yeah. Uh, we have a little bit of a jump start in the computing case because we actually do have intuition from the physics case, primarily from what's happened in 20th century physics, because we have things yeah. like general relativity and quantum mechanics and so on, which are essentially keying into these same ideas. 
it's just that we haven't taken those ideas and maybe some of the things which are coming up in you know distributed blockchain distributed consensus stuff maybe using some similar ideas um and you know it's kind of like it's a very fascinating sort of grand unification i mean it's it's okay it is okay so here's an interesting claim so you know uh, you know eugene wigner's long standing dubious claim about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics and physics right mm -hmm. Okay, so the question is, are we seeing an unreasonable effectiveness of computation in physics at this point? That is, is it the case that, or not, that ideas, I mean, I think, I think we didn't quite make it because the, you know, we didn't solve distributed computing before we, you know, sort of on, on a track to solve physics, so to speak. In other words, if we truly understood distributed computing, that would make solving these questions about physics vastly easier. But yeah, with the, proviso, with the proviso that the real theory of everything is something like the Wolfram model, right? Yeah, 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 right, which I'm, I have no doubt about at this point. But, um, you know, it's, it's, you know, the basic heuristic for models is, you know, at least in my life in doing science and so on, is models which have the property that vastly more comes out than you put in are usually models that are winners. Models that where you're, you know, you, every time you want to get something out, you have to put more in. Those models tend to be losers. And models where they keep on running into dead ends and you have to scramble very, very hard to get them out of the, oh, but it implies, you know, some crazy number of dimensions of space time or something like this. You know, that those tend to be models that, aren't going to be winners but i you know i have never seen a case like the one we're seeing now where basically there is great technical difficulty in understanding the implication of the model for different things but so far nothing got stuck you know there's nothing where we said oh my gosh we don't understand how a black hole can possibly form yes it's kind of technically complicated to see it but you can see kind of signs it's going to happen and then as you push harder technically you manage to home in further on what's going on. So I, I'm, I mean, I'm super hopeful, not only hopeful, but really quite convinced. I mean, it just, it, it just doesn't happen this way. You know, I've seen cases where a few ducks fell into order or something, but this number, I, I basically have never seen any other, in any other case. So I'm, you know, the, the, the sort of the Occam's razor criterion is, is more aligned in this case than I've ever seen it anywhere else. Now, mm -hmm. you know, it could, something bizarre could happen, but I think it's really unlikely. Um, but in any case, I mean, that, that um, uh, but, you know, coming back to the distributed computing thing, I think, you know, one of the things that's becoming clear, there's quite a bit of sort of existing, you know, thinking in between collaborative editing, just, you know, there's a bunch of these things which seem like, they are almost crying out for a kind of unifying theory. And, um, uh, you know, that seems like the thing that one, you know, is the unifying theory of those things basically general relativity? Is kind of, or something like general relativity? Is that kind of what's going on? That one will eventually have, you know, I mean, an interesting question is what is the analog of, um, I mean, I think we're going to have the analog of black holes and event horizons and things like that in these distributed computing systems. Um, there's sort of questions like, what's the analog of, um, there's probably an analog of the principle of equivalence and of, you know, uh, you know, the analog of the gravitational field, so to speak, in a distributed computing system. It's kind of like, um, you know, you have a certain set of processes, but this then relates again to the theory of foliations because, you know, the very idea that there could be a meaningful notion of a gravitational field is a consequence of some smoothness of foliations. If the typical foliations you picked were these incredibly complicated things that wiggle all over, all over the place, there would be no meaningful way that you could talk about, you know, having a gravitational field. I claim. I know that hmm. Jonathan has a point of view about that. I mean, the fact that you can talk about, you know, that it's reasonable to talk about gravitational fields with continuous properties is a consequence of the fact that the foliations you tend to look at don't wiggle it all over the place. Because yeah. if, if they were really complicated, you know, there'd be no, if their coordinates were sort of almost randomly chosen, then, you know, this notion of a field, oh, we've got a solution to Einstein's equations, it corresponds to this formula, you wouldn't have anything like that. 
you would have to say the solution Einstein's equations is an incredibly complicated thing with with these thousands of special cases that represent the different patches of you know in the you know different coordinate patches and so on. Yeah, hmm. I don't know if Jonathan has a point of view about this. Well, yeah, I mean, so obviously the equivalence principle says that a gravitational field can at some level be thought of as a fiction that you are constructing by your own fabrication of a of a of a foliation, right? You're, you're constructing some foliation that's maximally consistent with the evolutions of, you know, clocks that you see in your immediate vicinity. And the gravitational field is the, is the pseudo thing that you experience as a consequence of constructing that foliation. So of course, if you, you know, if you, if you as an observer are say Turing computable, then you cannot physically observe a gravitational field corresponding to say a Malamont Hogarth space time, because constructing that foliation would require you to perform a hypercomputation. Right. I mean, right. So, so, I mean, what you're basically saying is, but, but the question is, what's the analog of that in distributed computing? Right. Because the, the civilized foliations, I claim the civilized foliations will map into something, have a, you know, have a decent chance. Okay. So here's, here's an outrageous claim. Okay. You know, we experience the world in these ways that in which we think about, you know, simultaneity in time, we think about sort of space in a, you know, space time being foliated in a certain way. That's the sort of slice of our ruleal space that we choose, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have this, this um, um, now my claim would be that basically that, that is our experience of the world and we are used to it. If we can map that experience of the world into something in distributed computing, we will be able to understand distributed computing as represented in that kind of way. Now, in other words, we, we could have, if we had a very different experience of the world, we would have different sort of preferred kinds of foliations. But if we can map our preferred foliations as we have observed them in space time into distributed computing, we can use essentially our intuition from space time to have an understanding of distributed computing. Mm. I mean, you know, which, which is to say the notion that we live, for example, in distributed computing, it is not at all self-evident that we live in a finite dimensional space of processor communication. I mean, that's, that's going to be one of the issues, right? You, you could have, I mean, that was an issue, you know, you know, if, we, if, if the processors are communicating and implementing a, you know, a, a image processing algorithm in two dimensions or something, then we know that they have simple, that they're the effective, uh, you know, that, that's going to imply certain foliations being natural because the processors are communicating in, like in this two dimensional space. But it may also be that algorithms, you know, it could be that the algorithms of interest correspond to vastly more complicated and bizarre commun patterns of communication. Um, you, 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 sorry, were you going to say something? No, no, I, no. I, it's, it's been um, three hours and 40 minutes. I'm yeah, okay. bit... yeah we, right. we should wrap up. I, I need to go to... <laughs> right. uh, um, but, I mean, to, sorry, to answer your question, um, it, it's the statement that you, you, if you sort of do, if you insert a breakpoint into, into a distributed computation, you can't, and you look at the state, you can't tell the difference between uh, features of your debugger and features of the underlying processor hardware. Wow, that's an interesting claim. Right, because your, your debugger is what's constructing your personal foliation of the, of the multi-way evolution graph, but the, the actual sort of time evolution of each multi-way evolution branch is governed by processor speeds and things of the individual threads. So if you see some random foliation, you can't, the equivalence principle is what says you can't tell the difference between peculiarities of your debugger and peculiarities of the hardware that you're debugging. Okay, that, that may be the right place to end. That's a fascinating claim. I mean, that is, that is a claim which disembodied is so bizarre that, um, uh, you know, I mean, what's fascinating here, I mean, this is a, you know, this is actually very exciting. I mean, this is kind of a grand unification of, of um, sort of, you know, a bunch of, of, I mean, you know, general relativity is obviously vastly more mathematically developed than distributed computing. And, but on the other hand, distributed computing has the potential to let one play with things in a way that, you know, because we don't have black holes in the lab, we can't really play with these things and get intuition about general relativity. We can get into, you know, we've got two things going on. We've got a big mathematical structure in general relativity, 
and we've got the ability to actually do experiments in distributed computing. And I think that the combination of those two is really interesting. And um, anyway, okay, we should wrap up here. Well, um, all right, the um, and Tally can um, uh, yeah. can hang on for a minute. Um, okay, well, great. Uh, well, th thanks to everybody here, and thanks to folks on the uh, live stream, and um, we'll see you uh, another time. This was a complicated set of discussions here. All right, thanks a lot.